Hello, son and daughter. Welcome to Old Texas Scare Podcast. I've been working and living as a park ranger for almost five years now, stationed at a fairly remote outpost in the middle of the good old-fashioned American wilderness. For reasons I'd rather not get into, I can't disclose my exact location, but what I will say is that my workplace is effectively a lone watchtower surrounded by miles upon miles of forests and lakes. There's a bunch of these towers scattered around the county, though the nearest one to me is at least a day's hike away and barely a dot on the horizon. As rangers, our official designation is to keep troublemakers out of our woods. But that isn't why we're here. Our job is to keep things in. A little about me. I'm 27 years old and lived off the land for as long as I can remember. My old man was a hunter, and for most of my life I worked on our little ranch and helped my father track rabbits and deer. I went to school, too. I'm not a complete hick. But college wasn't for me, and I fell into a bunch of odd labor jobs. It was by pure chance I got this job. They were looking for someone who knew the lay of the land, to fill in a suddenly vacant position, and I guess they figured I was right for the job. I'll be blunt. The woods can be a very dangerous place. In all the time I've worked here, I've had to bury ten unlucky visitors. That might seem a lot to you, but trust me when I say that 10 is not bad going by this park standard. My more experienced colleagues in the northern regions have it a lot worse. Or so I'm told at the B weekly meetings we have at the center camp. Still, to me it's 10 people too many, and despite my best efforts to ward people away from the more unsafe areas of woodland, sometimes it feels like these people are trying to get themselves killed. My day, today routine isn't all that interesting, so I'll spare you that. I will say that I live on site, so although I have officially contracted hours and tasks that have to be completed, I'm technically at work 24-7. Once or twice a month, I'll take a drive into the town, and of course, there's the aforementioned meetings every fortnight, but most of the time, I'm completely isolated. I won't lie, it gets lonely out here, which is part of why I'm writing this journal. I guess it's nice to imagine someone reading it and being a part of my story. Enough sentiment. There have been some goings. On as of late that, to be frank, worry me. Reports of missing people are cropping up all over the park. Trevor, the guy manning the nearest station to me, once told me over the radio that he found the remains of one unlucky bastard halfway up a tree like a panada. It's getting hard to cover up, apparently, and there's talk of us having to buddy up on patrol shifts. Nobody knows if the incidents are connected, but by the sounds of things, it might have something to do with the summer rush. You see, around this time of year, we get almost triple the amount of visitors. During the hot summer months, we get all manner of tourists, party-goers, and more piling in from F knows. Where? These types of people are the worst. Most of them are harmless enough, but just don't understand the concept of simple rules like stay in your tent between 11 p.m. and 4 a.m. and don't wander into the woods by yourself. The first incident that I recall happened some three weeks back. I was overlooking the woods one evening, watching the sun begin its descent behind the distant mountain ranges and enjoying a smoke, when I hear the distinct sound of two gunshots ringing out in the distance. I cursed my luck. From the sounds of it, whoever it was had fired a rifle of some kind, most likely semi-automatic. Hunting is absolutely forbidden in our park, something we enforced strictly. I was just about to head inside and radio for backup. Trust me when I say you don't want to approach one or more gun, toting likely inebriated rednecks by yourself. When I heard another sound, a rising high-pitched scream of terror, followed by a guttural unearthly howl that set the hairs on, the back of my neck upright. Animals, particularly nocturnal ones, can make some pretty messed up sounds, but 
nothing I knew of could make that sort of noise. It sounded warped and unnatural, yet there was something undeniably lifelike that left me second guessing. I slung my rifle over my shoulder, grabbed a flashlight, and took off down the stairs in search of the source. I had a good sense of where it was coming from, and based on the gunshots I could tell I was within fifteen minutes. I only prayed I would be able to get there on time as I hauled ass along the trail. As I ran, several more shots rang out, the sound of which served as my guide. I could hear distant shouting sounded like two people at least, as well as more of those godforsaken sounds. My heart was pounding out of my chest, and I gripped my flashlight with white knuckles as I drew closer and closer. In the distance, I could make out the remains of what had been a campsite. The fire still smoldered, surrounded by scattered belongings. There was a tent, which was mostly intact, albeit crumpling in on one side, from where the supports had been knocked out by something. I found the first body there, a male in his mid-twenties, if I had to guess. His abdomen had been completely shredded, deep claw marks raked across his bare chest and stomach, and his guts scattered around him. His face was contorted, a permanent expression of terror spread across his countenance. The grass around him was almost black with his blood. I've seen and heard a lot in my time, but the sight and smell of his ruined body was enough to send me stumbling away, dry heaving. He hadn't gone easy. Another gunshot snapped me out of it. They were close, and I could actually make out the muzzle flash further down the trail. Another scream of terror, then one of pain. Then another gunshot. I could see from here what was happening, moving quickly to try and intervene, expecting to see a mama grizzly at the worst. I wasn't prepared for what I saw next. In the clearing ahead, there was something hunched over. It was big, at least seven or eight feet and its body was twisted and distorted, covered in patchy gray fur, flecked with crimson blood. From behind, I couldn't make out exactly what it looked like, but could see that it had somebody pinned, another man. A few feet ahead, another, fatter guy was cowering, trying to reload his rifle with shaking hands. The man on the ground thrashed around, letting out pained wails that dug into my ears, the hollering of someone who knows that they're about to die. It's not a sound anybody should have to hear. Whatever monster it was on top of him, it was devouring him. I saw it throw its head back, blood spraying indiscriminately, teeth tearing into the man's flesh. He weakly tried to break free, thudding his arms against its thick hide, but it either couldn't feel him or didn't care. It growled and snapped at its frantic prey, whose struggling grew weaker and weaker before ceasing entirely. It was then that I noticed how goddamn quiet it was out there. Not a sound, no wind, no trees rustling, just the whimpering of the fat man and the snapping and gurgling as the monster ate its fill. I crouched in the foliage a few dozen meters away, gun raised and flashlight at the ready. I wanted to help, but throwing myself at whatever the F this thing was would unalive myself. I think it was at about that point when I caught the fat man's gaze. His face pale, he frantically gestured for help. I shook my head, hushing him with a finger over pursed lips, then gestured for him to move towards me. Slow, I mouthed, hoping he would understand. He began shuffling towards me, circling the clearing. The monster didn't seem to acknowledge him, seemingly contented with its feast. I stayed put as he made painfully slow progress every second seeming to stretch out for much longer. He was maybe ten meters from me when something began to move in the woods behind him, and something else crashed through the tree line. The fat man turned around and screamed, a shrill, piercing cry that still sticks with me even all this time later. A second creature had emerged from the forest. It happened in a blur. I barely caught a glance of the thing as it hurtled itself towards the fat man. This one was a little smaller, its body distorted and twisted, moving on all four limbs as its cruel maw snapped open. Patches of fur covered its pale body, and a maw filled with needles that glinted in the moonlight honed in on its terrified victim. He threw up the gun, still empty of course, and barely got out a yelp before he was pinned to the ground. 
I damn near fainted watching it hunt over him and eat him alive. He screamed and gurgled as it got a grip on his leg and started dragging him, still conscious, back into the forest, leaving a blood trail in its wake. I could only watch, helpless and more frightened than I have been in my twenty-seven years, as the slaughter unfolded before me. I tried to move backwards, causing a branch to snap underfoot. I cursed silently as the first creature looked up instantly, its head snapping violently towards me, two piercing white eyes glinting in the darkness. Drool and gore hung from its mouth in blood strings as it wheezed softly, scanning the tree line for a moment before turning back to its meal. It was near dawn when I finally found the courage to move. Both creatures had long since left the former dragging what little remained of its quarry to have knows where. On first light, I slowly got to my feet and made my way back to my tower, and that's where it ended. I told my superiors what happened, and they assured me they would look into it. Clean up. Contact families. Formalities to them. It's been three weeks since, and things don't feel the same. In fact, I think that night was just the beginning. I haven't encountered those things, but I can't step outside past sundown without a chill going down my back. I've heard things from my colleagues, whispers really, about similar incidents happening across the park. We have another meeting tomorrow. I'm going to try and get to the bottom of this. Stay tuned. It's already been two weeks since I've got a job as a park ranger. It was an isolated area meant to preserve possible near. Extinction species, as they have no more than a dozens left alive. I remember that when I first applied, they made sure I went through enough training to prepare both physically and mentally. It was a very tough job, according to my supervisor, and would possibly include killing poachers if necessary. Of course I wasn't sure if it was acceptable to do that instead of arresting them, but the site was pretty much far away from any possible city, so I didn't complain and went along. Everything seemed normal at the first days on my shifts. The same patrol around and make sure everything is being preserved and protected for poachers. You know, the usual park ranger duties that is until the eleventh day when I was called to do the night shift as the guard assigned to it got into it terrible accident on the way home and broke his lee. Being someone who took the job seriously, I agreed to it and stayed for the night shift, but before I could start, my supervisor went to me and explained what to do, since it was different from my usual daytime shifts, since it's your first time in this position. I can assume you're not used to this role, right? He asked me as I geared up with the night shift tools. Yes, sir, I'm not used to work until late let alone on the dead of the night, but I've got confidence that I can do it until the other guy recovers. I answered, being a little nervous, but keeping my stance. He pulled me aside before I was about to start and explained me what I had to do and what to expect in certain situations. All right, so here are the basics. If you hear bone-cracking sounds, ignore them. If you hear metal rustling, turn off your flashlight. And if you hear voices calling for you that aren't coming from your radio... Shoot your gun to scare them away. Do I need to repeat anything? He asked in a serious way. No, sir, I understood everything. If you want, I can even get a note if I forget. I answered a bit nervous after his explanation. Good, I'll be reaching you to time from time to check. And as he said that, he walked away. Now alone and fully geared, I started to patrol. I was supposed to head to the north zone of the site and make sure everything is in order. The moon was shining bright, and everything was quiet and eerie. Not even owls could be heard. Everything was dead silent, save for my footsteps and the voice on the radio from my supervisor. As I was already midway on the path, I started to hear the metal rustling nearby, so as instructed, I turned off my flashlight and waited. It was obviously too dark to see, but I could make a silhouette that somewhat resembled a wolf with something on its back but it quickly ran off, and I turned on my flashlight again to keep moving. 
I was approaching the location. I heard the same voices I was told about my supervisor, who also could hear it from his radio, instructed me to fire my gun. But as I was about to do it, I realized I didn't load any bullet, and I noticed the voices getting closer, but they started to fade away on the darkness. It was tempting, so despite my supervisor telling me to proceed, I went off the path and followed the voices. That's when I found the source. It looked vaguely human, but its skin was so melted that it looked like clay. It was hard to hear, but I could make some words. It was trying to scream, Help, please itch. Help, I beg you, it hopelessly tried to say. I just stood there frozen, and when I turned my flashlight up, I noticed the wolf thing. It was huge, five foot five in height, if I had to guess. It had metal tendrils coming out of its it back, and it just stared as it pulled the melted body humanoid as it continued to beg for help. Without any choice, I ran back to the path and kept going until I reached my destiny and found my supervisor waiting for me. He pulled me inside the radio building and quickly shut the door. So what did you find on the way? He asked while panting from shutting the door. What do you mean? I could die because of that thing. Was it always here on the site? I yelled while trying to get answers. He just shut me off and explained everything to me. This place had more dangerous species that were largely hunted across the globe, so they were brought here to be kept. I was still confused about the situation. Why would they want them alive? Are they really that important? The next days in the night shift were much more quieter, but from time to time I would see the wolf thing or another weird animal that I couldn't make the details. I'm not sure what this place really is or what are all the things living within the area, but I know one thing. Those monsters were better off contained. Years ago, when my wife and I were dating, we talked about Bigfoot. I told her a story about my mother and father back in 1967. They were out by Spangenberg Lake in Lackawanna County, Pennsylvania, about 10 miles from where we lived. They told me that they had gotten his car about 4 a.m. and out of the woods came a huge white fur-covered beast on two feet. It stood way over the car. I asked my dad what its face looked like, and he said he didn't know, because he just hit the gas and got out of there. As I'm telling my wife this, I searched White Bigfoot on Google. Amazingly enough, a video pops up showing this White Bigfoot in Carbondale, Pennsylvania, which is one town over from us. The wooded sections behind Carbondale go all the way to Spangenberg Lake. I have no doubt it's real. This incident occurred in the town of Grays Creek, North Carolina. My brother Larry is working as a delivery man for the local branch of a nationwide pizza chain. He was tasked to deliver some pizzas to a college frat house. Larry's car was in the shop at the time, so he was driving his boss's pickup truck. He successfully delivered the pizzas and was driving back through Grays Creek on a road with overhanging oak trees. He had the windows open and was listening to the radio when all of a sudden he heard a loud bang from the bed of the truck. He slammed on the brakes while looking in the rearview mirror and could see something black up against the rear window. When he got to a full stop, he saw something flailing around and it managed to roll and push its way to the open tailgate to get out of the truck bed. Larry was still looking in the rearview mirror trying to figure out what this thing was when he saw it stand on two feet and rise to an estimated height of seven feet. He grabbed and tilted the mirror so he could see its face and right as he got it in focus, it looked right into the mirror back at him with an expression of pure murderous hate on its human-like face. It then let out a huge and super loud screeching roar. Larry ain't no dummy. He turned right back around and stomped on the gas because he knew if this thing got its hand on him, it would absolutely tear him apart. Larry says he has no recollection of driving back to the pizza joint. Just that the next thing he knew, he was getting out of the truck and his knees buckled. He would have fallen out flat had he not managed to catch himself in the door's armrest. He said that he stayed squatted and was gulping air for about three minutes. 
Then he went into the pizza place trying to look like he was all right. The rest of the story comes from my mother. When Larry's boss saw him, he knew Larry was definitely not all right because he was as pale as a sheet, and his eyes were huge. Larry's manager turned him right back around and drove him home. Larry says he has no memory of saying anything to his boss during the drive. Mom walked Larry back to his room so he could lie down while my dad and Larry's boss looked at his truck. The part of the bed sides near the window was crumpled downwards a good bit, and there was blood in the bed as well. There were also some tufts of hair, and there was a really bad smell. Dad said it smelled like a skunk had sprayed down a burning tire while King Kong crept on it. Mom and Dad wound up sitting up with Larry all night because he was obviously in a state of shock, and they came close to taking him to the hospital a couple times. But Larry insisted he was okay. He related his story to both Mom and Dad a little while afterward. They say they both believed him, and my parents have always been experts at spotting lies. Trust me on that one. About a year later, Mom, Dad, my wife, and I, along with Larry and his family, were vacationing together, and I was excited that I'd get to ask him about his experience face to face. I sat down with a notepad and pen and downloaded a voice recorder app on my phone. He looked both and just said, "No way. I don't want you submitting this to any Bigfoot organization." Furthermore, he said that this was going to be the last time we talked about this. I agreed and asked some questions that helped fill in the blanks in the account. I just shared it with you. I saw both the fear in his eyes and goosebumps rise up on his arms more than once. You can't fake that, and it really hits home for me. My brother is former special forces and served a tour over in the sandbox. A rake, he just doesn't get scared. The anticipation was palpable as I finalized the purchase of my new hunting property deep in the rugged Texas wilderness. The land was untamed, teeming with game. And a thrill for any hunter like me. Little did I know that this new acquisition would lead to a horrifying encounter that would haunt me for the rest of my days. I quickly set up trail cameras throughout the dense forest, eager to get a sense of the wildlife on my new land. The first few weeks were uneventful, capturing images of deer, raccoons, and the occasional bear. But one crisp autumn morning, as I checked the latest trail camera photos, my excitement turned to unease. There, amidst the ordinary animal captures, was a picture that sent chills down my spine. It was a dark, massive figure covered in fur, with a human-like face, staring with its gray, dead eyes directly into the camera. It was unmistakable—a Sasquatch. The legendary creature that had been whispered about in hushed tones by hunters and locals for generations. My heart pounded as I examined the photo over and over. Surely it was some weirdo in a costume, perhaps an inbred black bear. I kept making excuses as to what it was in order to comfort myself. I knew the consequences of sharing this with anyone. I'd be ridiculed, deemed a madman. Obviously, no one would believe me. So naturally, the need to prove what I had seen gnawed at me. Determined to find answers, I decided to venture into the woods with my loyal hunting dog Max by my side. The day was overcast, the forest eerily silent as Max and I hiked deeper into the woods. The anticipation weighed heavily on me. As excited as I may have been, I, I was terrified. Deep down, though, I figured I probably wouldn't even encounter it. Hours passed, and the sun began its descent. Just as I had given up hope, we heard it—a low, guttural growl resonating through the trees. My hand instinctively went to the rifle slung over my shoulder. I signaled for Max to stay close, but the faithful dog growled, his hackles raised. Suddenly, it emerged from the shadows. That familiar, massive, dark figure covered in matted black fur, with piercing eyes that held a deep primal intelligence. It was said Sasquatch, and it had found us. Fear gripped me hard, and my heart raced as I raised my rifle, not intending to harm the creature, but only to ward it off. 
The Sasquatch, with a speed that defied its size, lunged forward, its massive arms closing around Max. My loyal dog let out a heart-wrenching yelp as the creature's grip tightened. I fired my rifle, but missed completely as the beast flew about the thick woods, carrying my buddy, Max, in its filthy grip. The world seemed to slow down, and I watched in abject horror as Max was being torn apart by the monstrous beast. The Sasquatch's eyes bore into mine, an intelligence in them that sent a shiver down my spine. With Mac's lifeless body cradled in its arms, the Sasquatch turned and vanished back into the forest, leaving behind a shaken and anguished hunter. I was left in the darkening woods, the weight of guilt and grief pressing down on me. I wanted to cry, but yet I was emotionless. I'd sought proof but the cost was higher than I could have ever imagined. As I made my way back to my cabin, the forests once, familiar beauty now held a sinister aura. The Sasquatch was no longer a legend. It was a brutal reality that had torn my world apart, and I would forever be haunted by the memory of that fateful encounter. The chilling scream of the Sasquatch echoed in my ears a reminder that the line between myth and reality had blurred, and the forest held secrets more terrifying than I had ever imagined. I've encountered bears, snakes, moose, and recently a bobcat, but I never felt terror like I did when I was a kid. I was at a beach in Juneau with my parents and sister when I was very young. It was a nice day, the river was blue, and so was the sky for once. A bunch of families with small children and babies were out just barbecuing. We were walking along the beach toward the picnic area, and I heard a baby crying in the woods. I learned about Kushtakaya and Wendigo and other stories about things mimicking people at school, but at the time it didn't cross my mind that it was odd. Nobody else was concerned about this crying child. So my stupid ass lets my family walk ahead, and I go into the woods. I didn't get very far when I centered in on the sound. I could still see the beach from the trees. I didn't see a baby or kid on the ground anywhere, but I heard the sound again and looked up at a tree. It was a goddamn raven sitting there making baby noises. A different raven swooped at me from the side and knocked my hat off, and I took off running back to my parents. Later, the only thing I could think of as to why they did that was my hat was neon pink with sparkly sequins on it, and they wanted the sequins. Scared the shit out to me then, and still creeps me out to think about. I'd like to tell you about the encounter my son had, maybe four years ago. He told me about it then, but I had no clue. Now we have dogman encounters, and now I know. Here's what happened. My son's friend was driving him home, about 11 p.m., through a rural residential area. The houses are spaced some distance apart. They were on a two-lane highway with no street lights and very little traffic. The area is not overly wooded, but is patches of trees and fields. This area would probably be included in foothills of the Smoky Mountains. Anyway, they were driving along when suddenly, from the right side of the road, this thing sprang out and was across the road and into the bushes on the other side in two leaps or bounds or steps or however you want to say it. It was in full view because of their headlights. My son said the first thing he thought was dog. He went on to say that it was running on all fours like a deer. He said it was a color of a deer with a huge dog head, massive shoulders, and a really small waist. He kept repeating how big it was, so I asked for a comparison. I asked if he meant huge, like maybe a big deer, or was it maybe as tall as a cow? He answered, and I can quote his answer, Mom, this thing was massive. If we had hit it, the car would have gone underneath it, and its body would have hit the windshield. I don't remember what kind of car it was, but it was about the size and shape of one of those older Sentras. He said that neither he or his friend said anything for about ten seconds, and then his friend yelled, Did you see that? 
My son said yes, and they didn't say another word the rest of the way. And that's it. It's really creepy to me, and I thought other listeners like Mike to hear about it. This happened in late August of 97 in a side valley of Gold Stream Valley, a relatively populated area just north of Fairbanks. Although it's quite close to the Fairbanks area with many houses and roads and the main part of Gold Stream, the side valleys are still as wild as they were a thousand years ago. I was hunting roughed grouse in one of these side valleys, and I prefer not to disclose which one. I was on a south-facing aspen, covered hillside, and had been hunting all afternoon and evening, intending to spend the night out on the hill and hunt my way back in the morning. As I was making camp, a black bear almost walked right into me. I heard him coming from a distance and scared him away before he got closer. Later on, it will become apparent why I mentioned this. So I was sleeping out in the open without a tent under a spruce tree. Sometime in the middle of the night, I was awakened by something crawling around my camp, maybe 30 feet or so away from me, walking in the circle I mentioned earlier. The bear I mentioned before wasn't the source of these sounds. My father is a hunting guide, and I literally grew up hunting bears, so I know what a bear sounds like when it's walking. Whatever this thing was, it was walking on two legs with a bit of a shuffling sound between each step as if it was dragging its feet just a bit. The leaves on the forest floor were dried like potato chips, and it was breaking a lot of branches. I could hear it and follow its movements quite distinctly. I have to say that I've spent a lot of time here in the Alaskan bush and have never before or, or since been truly afraid of anything I've encountered. But I don't mind saying that on that particular night, I was literally shaking with fear. It, or whatever it was, circled my camp for what seemed like hours, but it was probably only five or so minutes. Finally, remembering something I once read about Indian beliefs regarding woodsmen, I started talking to it, albeit in a shaky voice, saying I wanted no trouble that night. The thing stopped dead in its tracks, and then a few moments later I heard it trotting downhill away from me. Talking to such a creature may sound kind of cornball, but... All I know is that it works. I've kicked myself for this many times since, but the next morning I didn't bother to look for any tracks, hair, or evidence. I just packed up and resumed my hunting. I had no further trouble with the woodsman. As a final couple of notes, I do recall hearing a kind of low muttering sound as it was prowling around. Also, having since done some reading on Bigfoot sightings, I've noticed that a lot of people reported the animal having a strong, foul odor. However, I did not smell any particular odor, foul or otherwise. Most of the native peoples of Alaska seem to have stories about the woodsman, the bushman, or even the hairy man. Other than this, I've never heard of anyone I know having an actual encounter with a woodsman in Alaska. This incident occurred in June 2019 while I was still living in Nashville, Tennessee. My school had let out and I was staying at a friend which between friends and me, I'd drop off my stuff and then wander the neighborhood late at night because I couldn't sleep. Now don't get me wrong, I've had plenty of strange things happen to me on my night walks. From the homeless offering me a duck to being followed by a car of drunk guys, but this one was different. One night I saw two figures come out of the woods. They looked smaller and younger than me, and I was instantly curious. I followed the kids, staying quiet, when suddenly the little girl, she seemed to be younger than the boy, stood in the middle of the road. Of course I bolt out and tackle her as a car comes, the thing nearly missing both of us. When I looked down, the little girl was more annoyed than happy or grateful. What got my attention was the black eyes. It was like starting into a void. I couldn't look away as soon as I looked into them. I felt a rush of fear so strong that it overwhelmed everything. I still don't know how long that it lasted, or if anything happened, but the next thing I knew, the boy was ripping me off the girl with surprising strength. By now, I was completely freaked. I couldn't bring myself to check his eyes. 
Doing what I felt best, I literally slipped his grip and took off sprinting. I could hear them running after me, yelling for me to wait, to stop, and I don't know why, but I almost did. I ended up sprinting through backyards until I couldn't hear them, before going to my friend's. She's the one that told me of black-eyed kids. I'm not crazy. I know it really happened. I was rabbit hunting between the hours of 20, 130 CDT to about 2315 CDT on a farm outside of Maud, Oklahoma. It was a clear and cold night with a quarter moon out. I was armed with a pump-action tactical shotgun and a Kimber 5 in 45 cow pistol along with about 100 rounds of 45 and 45 shotgun rounds. Both weapons are equipped with high-end white lights. Upon returning to my home at about 2315 CDT, I walked up on my patio, which is about five feet off the ground. I saw a large human like figure that was bigger than any man I ever saw. I used the surefire white light on my shotgun to see better. Due to light fog, I could only see about 25 feet with the light. The creature was out in the open enough to see an outline of the figure. I had seen all my animals act unusual prior, a feeling of being watched at hours of darkness more than once. The figure was watching me and made eye contact. It was very large and close to seven to eight feet tall, was a very stocky build, would guess over 400 pounds. The figure seemed annoyed that I pointed my shotgun at it. It seemed to have no fear of me or my animals. My dog, military craned, cowered down and would not respond to commands. I did contact a Bigfoot team that showed up within 72 hours of this. No evidence was found. No footprints, hair, nothing. I did experience some lapses in memory thereafter. I'm a retired Special Forces sniper with 10 years of experience and three tours in Iraq, including the Iraq invasion with the 3rd M. Div on the front lines. I have no knowledge after all I have seen and done to describe this figure. I do need to be kept out of any public report because of my background and security clearance with the military. I just want answers and will provide full cooperation in person. The biggest thing that bothers me is the lack of fear from the figure and my fear back. I fear very little in life. Just want to get to the bottom of this. Something that I wouldn't believe unless I saw it just stepped up about 30 feet in front of me, stared at me, and kind of grunted before walking into the woods very quietly. I did have a rifle and a handgun on me because I was out hunting, but for some reason I did not feel threatened. However, I did turn around and head back to my car, often glancing over my shoulder. On several occasions I heard cracking branches and a few low to high tones coming from the direction that the really tall, at least six feet shaggy, dark brown thing had gone. It made me want to walk a little faster. Some of those sounds were answered from the other side of the road, but other than that, no further sightings or hearing took place over the years. I should mention that this also occurred back in 1964, and I have not been able to put it out of my mind. It happened on a small dirt road about 30, five miles south of Fairbanks. This dirt road was directly off the Richardson Highway heading south. You take a left off the highway, and this road led to an old area near a small pond, which was about two miles in. Hell hit or sonic bark. I haphazardly called out to one of these things, saying, Go Ju Ra, near Salt Creek in Elk Grove, Illinois. In response, I received a harrowing 15-second howl, which was a combination of a whistle and a scream, on July 23, 2016. That same day, a rock struck the roof of my 18-foot work truck. Shortly after that, my neighbor's dog was dismembered and placed in different garbage cans behind my house. A month later, I heard what sounded like a bark, but it appeared to come from at least a mile away. 
As a kid, I frequently explored the woods around Chicago. I recall seeing two very tall oak trees, roughly 50 to 70 feet in height, tied together at the top. This area was known for being frequented by Satanists. This is a report from a native who claims to have seen a hairy person, approximately six to seven feet tall, covered in hair. This sighting occurred as he was walking casually across the dirt road by Skylack Lake. More specifically, it happened on Skylack Lake Road, which is a side road branching off from the main highway and leading into the woods. According to the witness, this creature looked at him and came to a stop in the middle of the road, appearing surprised. Then it swiftly disappeared into the woods. The witness estimated that he was about 300 yards away from it at the time of the encounter. Notably, there was no snow on the ground yet. He mentioned that they observed each other for a brief moment, prompting him to load his single-shot shotgun as a precaution, since he wasn't sure if the creature was friendly or not. However, he decided against reporting the incident to the authorities, believing that nobody would believe his story. The witness seemed very serious when recounting the experience. It's worth noting that the man is a devout Christian, and this event took place probably around late October or early November. The location is in the vicinity of Sterling, Alaska, and is characterized by a dense spruce forest. I've been to the area myself, and it's secluded from the main highway, surrounded by forests, lakes, and mountains. This took place yesterday, which is odd because it's my birthday. I was out scouting a piece of public land in Racine County, Wisconsin, and I had been zigzagging through a swamp looking for deer sign for this upcoming season. I was seeing some tracks and found a few beds, but nothing to get super excited about, and I thought it was strange that I wasn't bumping any deer considering the wind was in my face and I was creeping pretty slow, so I kept pushing further into the swamp to where it turned into pretty dangerous bog. I then paralleled the danger zone until I hit where the swamp made a transition to timber and started following a deer trail that followed the transition. I followed it for about 100 yards looking for rubs telling me a big buck might be coming to and from the swamp. I suddenly felt like a cold creepy feeling and I just kind of shrugged it off and kept going another 20 yards when I felt it again. So I just stopped and looked all around and that's when I saw something blackish gray about six feet tall move very fast from the timber or swamp transition into a patch of super thick brush. And right when I was starting to think what the heck is that, I heard I would guess what would be about 70 five yards or so away farther in like a very very large dog like growl or bark or roar that literally made me instantly terrified i pulled my pocket knife out because it's all i had and slowly backed out until i got to the road where i ran like i i've never ran before until i got to my truck i wanted to go to the house across the street and ask them if they'd ever seen anything strange around but I didn't want to seem like a nut job, so I just left. I've been hunting since I was nine, and I'm 27 now, and I know for certain it was no raccoon, no coyote, or anything other animals that we have around, including the rare cougar, which the Dean Jar says doesn't exist around here, but I know good, reliable people who have seen them. And I looked up every cougar call and sound I could find, and nothing comes even remotely close to it. I'm not scared of anything in the woods, but I know we're not supposed to have blackish-gray, six-foot-tall upright animals in Racine County, Wisconsin. I'm pretty well confused about the whole thing, and for the first time in my life, scared of the forest. My dad is a captain of a container ship. I've heard some stories and seen some crazy pictures. He actually knows Captain Phillips because they work for the same company, so I have heard some things about him. Most of the craziest pictures and stories I've heard, though, are just about the waves. 
They got hit with huge waves that actually destroyed containers on the ship and knocked a bunch into the ocean. The other cool story is my dad and his crew saved some guy who, for some reason, was in the Atlantic on a fishing boat. Someone spotted him from the deck and his boat was about to get collapsed, so they went down and got him up the ladder. I saw something bizarre while at sea. My time to shine! In 1980, I was one of ten Royal Canadian Sea Cadets on board HMCS Quapel 264, a lovely Canadian destroyer escort commissioned in 1962. We were refueling at sea with the HMCS protector, so both ships are sailing parallel to each other with a fuel line in between. Two or three whales were swimming near the bow of the protector. The bow came out of the water, then back in. I assume one of the whales was coming up as the ship went down. The next wave brought the bow out of the water again. The whale's tail came up too. A spray of dark blood painted the starboard side of the bow. I briefly saw the damaged portion of the tail before the whale disappeared. In an instant, the whale was gone, and the ship dove into the water, erasing any evidence of the last two or three seconds. I was amazed, and I looked around to see if anybody saw what I saw. Another cadet said he thought he saw something on the bow, but wasn't sure what it was. The regular crew members didn't give a flying F. On the same cruise, a pile of neatly folded clothes were found on the rear deck. Apparently, a seaman jumped overboard into the prop wash somewhere in the middle of the Pacific. Girlfriend called it off while we were at sea. I used to commercial fish off the Oregon coast. We would typically be out 80, 150 miles for albacore tuna. This trip was for halibut, however, so we're using long line gear. Sits on the bottom. Similar to swordfish, if ever seen that go out. Anyways, we pulled gear, and there was like this half-eel, half-ugly, shark-looking thing. I'd never seen anything like it, nor had anyone else on the boat, both of which had been doing this since the 70s. Unfortunately, it was the first day, and we planned to be out for several, so couldn't have kept it on board. Anyways, not the greatest story, just thought I would share. Rogue waves were always the weirdest or scariest things to me. One put us in danger that was 15, 20 foot high. Former United States Navy air crewman here. On New Year's Day, 1993, our crew was the Ready Alert crew. The Ready Alert is exactly what it sounds like. If anything happens and they need to send a plane up to check something out, one plane is ready to launch at any time to do so. We were launched on a search and rescue mission to see if we could locate a sailboat that had been overdue for a few weeks in the North Atlantic. During our flight, the weather was miserable. The sea was nearly white with foam and ice. I personally saw numerous water spouts, and I remember just thinking to myself, those poor bastards. Maybe if we'd have been sent out looking for them soon after they were reported missing. But not now. Not in this. We're not gonna find anything. We spent eight hours searching. We never found anything. What you're about to read is a little weird. Correction. It's a lot weird. But, for whatever reason... I felt it was interesting enough to write down. Keep in mind that there are first-hand stories, second-hand stories, and so on. This is a third-hand story with as little poetic license as necessary. I am confident I have recorded the details with a high degree of accuracy. It may get confusing, but here we go. What I know of this story came from my close friend Doe. I have known Doe for many years. He is a successful businessman and I would never question his integrity. Several months ago, Doe came by my office, and while we visited, he related the details of a conversation he had with one of his longtime customers. 
To be honest, Doug and I both don't know what to make of this strange conversation with his customer. His story may just be the raving of a schizophrenic, although the credibility of the person who shared their first-hand account with Doe would make a diagnosis of schizophrenia difficult to imagine. That would at least make sense. But it's an interesting story nonetheless. After writing it down, I emailed the story to Doe for verification. He confirmed I had written the account down as accurately as he felt possible. With that introduction, here is what Doe told me. I have this customer who sat down with me at my office and posed a very strange question. He asked, Do you believe in UFOs? I have only known him for a short time, but I do know he was in the United States Marine Corps, and he has enough accolades and credentials that I would not question his integrity. He comes across as extremely reputable, which makes his story both intriguing and bizarre. To protect his identity, and since I do not have his permission to relate this story, I will refer to him as John. I told John that I, of course, do believe some things have been seen flying and at the same time been unidentifiable. What I don't know is what they were, since, of course, they are by their very nature unidentifiable. That is as logical of a statement as I could have made. John appeared to have accepted my answer. He took it as an affirmative, which is to say that I do in fact believe in UFOs. Crossing that bridge, the strange story began to unroll out of John's mouth. The following is the story told by John to my friend Doe. The story John shared revolved around an elderly friend who lived close to him. I will call his elderly friend Tom. One day, Tom asked John if, in fact, he believed in UFOs. John answered in the affirmative. Tom proceeded. He said he had something he wanted to show John. But first, before sharing his story, he must take John to a site in Las Vegas. Once the evening had settled in and the sun had long disappeared behind the Red Rock Mountains, the two of them drove to the corner of Tropicana and Decatur Belve. Just a few miles west of the Las Vegas Strip, this site is well known by long-time Vegas residents who live on the west side of the city. The name it is known by is the Pits. Due to its strange and varied dirt mounds, it is favored by dirt bike enthusiasts. And although it is not far from the famous Las Vegas Strip, it remained undeveloped due to several reasons. The first would be the cost of leveling the ground, and the second would be its location, being part of a major wash heading into Las Vegas. The city of Las Vegas has contended for years, with flash floods and washes are not the best sites to develop. When they arrived at the pits, they pulled off into the desert and walked to a spot where Tom indicated they should stop. Tom began surveying the area with what John assumed was a metal detector. After some searching, he found a spot where the detector came alive. He placed a rock at that point. Then he went off in another direction until the detector sounded again. Another rock was placed at the second point. Again, he repeated his search for a spot in the dark that would complete an equilateral triangle. Sure enough, the detector sounded at the exact spot. He placed a third rock. All the time, searching and setting up the triangle, Tom kept checking his watch. With all three corners of the triangle revealed, he began to feel his way to the true center of the triangle. Judging his position relative to the three points of the triangle and feeling confident he was in position, he stepped aside and placed John dead center in the triangle. Tom stepped back, staring at his watch and waited. John, he said, in just a minute you will feel a pulse through your body. The points of the triangle are places where transmission pillars have been buried deep in the earth. In the center of these transmission pillars, where you now stand, is where the transmission waves will be generated. Where they are transmitting to, I don't know. But I do know these transmissions occur at regular intervals during the late night. And when they occur, you can feel them. They're about to transmit any minute now. They both remained quiet as they waited. Suddenly, just as Tom had described, John felt a sensation in the darkness. John described a physical force like an electrical pulse, rolling up his body from his toes to his head. It was as if a group of people were surrounding you with rolling pins, and they were rolling them up your body from your toes to the top of your head. 
It didn't last too long, and just as suddenly as it started, it stopped. It was never made clear to John how Tom knew about these transmission events. He was only told that, for whatever reason, Tom had known about certain alien information for many years and was sworn to secrecy. With that experience under John's belt, Tom felt confident that John was prepared for what Tom felt compelled to show him. The only reason Tom gave for showing John any of this was just in case. Next, Tom took John on a drive outside of Las Vegas. They headed west on the Blue Diamond Highway leading toward Par Rock, Nevada. The town of Blue Diamond is about 15 to 20 miles southwest of Las Vegas. At some point near Blue Diamond, Tom drove off the highway and headed into the desert. Tom told him that what he was about to show him, he needed to get off his chest. He had information about aliens among us and was sworn to secrecy. He had kept these secrets for as long as he could, which John assumed was many years. At Tom's advanced age, he wanted someone else to know some of what he knew. The headlights bounced in front of their car, illuminating the dirt road that led deeper into the desert. As cacti and sagebrush rushed past them, Tom confessed that by spilling the beans, his life would be in danger. Regardless of the consequences for both of them, they drove on. Moments later, they pulled up to a door in the middle of nowhere, set into the side of a rocky bluff. This door, this location, this place, was what Tom wanted John to see. They only stayed a moment when Tom said, We have to leave right now. They know we are here. As they drove away from the mysterious door, suddenly lights appeared to them as headlights materialized virtually out of nowhere and began following them. Tom picked up speed. At several points, the lights tailed them no less than three feet off their back bumper. Jolts of anxiety, fear, and panic swept through both Tom and John. Without warning, the lights went black. Tom craned his neck to look back. No lights or vehicles were visible. Only darkness. That was the last time John would see Tom. Days after this strange experience, John saw Tom out but was unable to find him. Tom's home was empty and none of his neighbors knew where he went. None of them saw him leave. The neighbor across the street claimed to see men in white hazmat suits take all Tom's belongings. After several days not being able to move past the strange events, John decided he would revisit the transmission site. Late one evening, while driving home from work, he made a detour to the pits. As he approached, he anticipated pulling into the desert area where he and Tom had once parked. He discovered that he wouldn't be able to pull off the road due to a dirt berm having been erected. He instead parked his truck on the shoulder of the road and got out. He made his way to the berm and climbed up, instead of the dark, vacant area he had visited days before. Now before him was a lot of construction equipment and massive construction lights flooding the entire area. He climbed up the berm and, while resting on his stomach, looked over to see what all the commotion was about. No sooner had he begun looking when, suddenly, as if on cue, floodlights all around the construction site turned and pointed their beams directly at his position. Not wanting to feel paranoid, he quickly left the area and drove home. Later he learned the city had started construction on a flood retention basin and park at the site. John still couldn't shake the feelings left by this experience. Where was Tom, considering what was going on at the transmission site? Did any of it have to do with Tom? Eventually, he shared the experience with a couple of his friends. They, of course, were curious and wanted him to show them the door in the desert. After some coaxing, John agreed, and they headed out. They took his friend's vehicle, and John set shotgun. At one point, as they were driving the dirt road... John began to feel nervous and admittedly scared. He considered telling his friend to take a wrong turn, acting as though he had forgotten the directions on how to get there. He knew had he acted as if he didn't remember the location of the door, he'd take a lot of heat from his friends. Instead of deflecting, he found himself drawn closer in the direction of the door. His own curiosity had gotten the best of him. As they drove along, they saw up ahead an old pickup truck that had pulled off alongside the dirt road. As they approached, they could make out an extremely tall, thin man leaning against the driver's side door. His dress was casual, and he sported a pair of dark sunglasses. 
They pulled up behind the truck, and the tall man walked up to the driver's window, bent down, and asked them what they were doing out there. We're just driving around, said the driver, and they all gestured in the affirmative. You need to turn around, he told them. You've driven onto private property. Who are you? they said, pushing back with a little attitude, not willing to immediately comply. I'm the law out here, he said, but he wore no uniform, nor did he flash a badge. The tall man offered no sign of authority. John's friends were unimpressed. The tall man straightened, paused, then slowly walked around the vehicle and lowered his head into the passenger's window where John sat. John's window was down. When he was face to face with John, he raised his sunglasses and looked directly into his eyes. What John saw in the tall man's eyes sent a shock throughout his entire body. Looking back at him were not the eyes of a man. The tall man's eyes were more feline than human, and he addressed John by his full name. John Blank, he said. Consider this your warning. Do we have an understanding? John said yes, and with that they drove away. That is the extent of the story as told by John to my friend Doe. I don't know any more. I have lived in Las Vegas for over 50 years and have never seen a door in the desert, but they're a part of the desert around Blue Diamond that are not accessible to the public. Doe has approached John since talking to me and asked if he would be willing to take us to the door. So far, the answer is no. Not me, but my dad. He was taking a piss after field dressing a deer he just shot. From the darkness about ten, fifteen feet away, a cougar screamed at him, which sounds like a woman screaming bloody murder. Seriously, YouTube a video. It's nuts. He nearly shit himself and thankfully had a pistol on him. He fired a warning shot and loaded the deer on the gator to finish at Camp LOL. The cold was the first thing I noticed, a biting, relentless cold that seemed to seep into your bones and never let go. My name is Josh, and I was leading a Navy SEAL team on a mission that, in hindsight, was doomed from the start. We were sent to investigate a distress signal from a research station in Antarctica that had gone dark weeks ago. As an ex-CIAA agent, I was no stranger to high-stakes operations, but nothing could have prepared me for what we found, or didn't find, at the station. The place was a ghost town, abandoned equipment scattered around, and an eerie silence that pressed down on you. But it was the artifact that changed everything. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen, ancient yet otherworldly, and from the moment we laid eyes on it, a whisper filled the air. It wasn't just noise. It was as if the artifact was speaking directly into our minds, sowing seeds of doubt and fear. The effects were almost immediate. Paranoia crept in, turning team members against each other, seeing threats where there were none. We tried to stay focused to secure the artifact and figure out what happened to the researchers, but it was like the station itself was against us. Violent hallucinations haunted us, scenes of terror that felt all too real, blurring the lines between what was happening and what was imagined. Then the entity appeared. It was a master of our fears, a shapeshifter that could become anything it wanted. One moment it was a fallen comrade, the next a grotesque monster. It hunted us using our own minds as weapons against us. We fought back, but how do you fight something that knows your deepest fears? One by one, my team fell, victims of the entity or the madness the artifact induced. I can't say for sure. I was alone, isolated in the freezing wasteland, with the whispers growing louder. In a moment of clarity, or perhaps desperation, I fled, leaving behind the artifact and the horrors it unleashed. I called for backup, hoping against hope that they could contain whatever we had unleashed. But when they arrived, they found nothing. No research station, no sign of my team, just endless ice and snow. They didn't believe me, said it was all in my head, a result of paranoia and isolation. 
the artifact, the entity, my fallen team. According to them, none of it was real. Now I'm here, locked away in a lunatic hospital, a place where they tell me I'm paranoid, that I've lost touch with reality. But I know what I saw, what I experienced. The cold still lingers, a constant reminder of the truth they refuse to believe. The whispers haunt me, even in the silence of my room, a chilling echo of the horror that lies hidden beneath the ice. They say I'm mad, but I know the truth. The horror is real, and it's still out there, waiting beneath the endless expanse of Antarctica. Every town has its urban legend. Bigfoot, Mothman, Dogman, and of course the occasional ghost story. Such is the case for the town of Wintermill. Along the northern border of the town lies the Sherman Lake or, as it's been called lately, the Lonely Skaters Lake. The story begins with a young woman with hair like golden silk. She was elegant, graceful, and a goddess on the ice. Every winter, when the lake froze over, she was the first to put on her ice skates. Her agility and skill was so great that any onlooker would be stilled into silence. Her movements caught the sunlight just right, sending beams glistening off her golden hair and silk-white tight. She was preparing herself for the Winter Olympics and dreamed of that golden medal around her neck. So she practiced and practiced and practiced. Every winter she was out on the ice and her skills grew ever greater. One year there was a warm winter. Weeks went by without the temperature dropping long enough for the lake to freeze. The woman waited impatiently, ticking down the days till spring and growing desperate as it approached. Finally, on a chilly winter night, the temperature dropped enough for the lake to freeze, and out she went. She didn't often skate at night, but having missed so many days, she was desperate. She slid and glided along the ice, and silver moonlight danced off her yellow hair and sharpened skates. Unknown to her, she was being watched. From the shores of the lake stood a man. Many think to be a scorned lover. He put on his own pair of skates and went out to her. She was so focused on her routine, she didn't notice his approach. She only became aware of his presence when his hands went around her waist. He skated in sync with her, lifting her and twirling her around as they danced on the ice. No one knows what was said, but that she turned him down once again, and for the last time, he had his hands on her dainty hips skating behind her. Red flashed before his eyes, and he lifted one foot. With glistening steel, the man swiped the bottom of his skate against her heels, slashing both of them. The woman cried out, falling to the icy ground and screaming in pain. Her Achilles tendons were slashed wide open and blood stained her white skates and tights. The heat from her blood proved too much for the recently frozen ice and it melted beneath her. Down she was sucked into the blackness of the lake, her voice crying out in large shimmering bubbles. The last thing she saw was the silhouette of the man against the silver moon. Since then, and for every winter yet to come, when the lake freezes over, some say you can catch a glimpse of the once talented young skater. She glides on the ice as a shimmering white silhouette, the moonbeam still dancing off her. But where she skates, she leaves a long trail of shimmering red, melting the ice wherever she goes. You can sometimes still hear her screams before she disappears below the ice in a cloud of red and white smoke. I was talking on the telephone when a foul odor suddenly filled the room. It was a strange and unsettling scent that made me uneasy. I decided to go to my bedroom, but as I entered, I couldn't shake the feeling that someone was watching me. My instincts were on high alert, and I felt a sense of foreboding. Looking out the window, I was astonished to see an oval-shaped object with portholes surrounded by red, green, and white lights that were revolving around it. It hovered about 100 feet above, and its diameter was an impressive 75 feet. The sight was surreal, and I was both fascinated and frightened. I immediately woke up my husband, Everett, and he saw it too. 
we were both taken aback by the mysterious craft in the sky. I felt the need to share this bizarre encounter with my married daughter, Mrs. Janet Emery, who lived about a mile away. The Emerys also witnessed the unusual sight, and their neighbor even saw it through binoculars, confirming its extraordinary nature. Janet went outdoors to observe more closely and saw the UFO eject a red ball which moved in an erratic manner while the first UFO departed southward. The red ball flew just a few feet above her head, and she described it as oval with a shiny underside that resembled aluminum foil. It was larger than her cottage and yard combined. The whole experience was accompanied by the same foul odor that I had initially smelled. When I finally went to bed, the strange odor still lingered in the house. After some time, the room was suddenly filled with a brilliant white light, illuminating everything around me. It was an instant that felt like eternity. Then as quickly as the light appeared, it vanished, leaving me startled and bewildered. Right at the foot of my bed, a globe of light, about 21 inches in diameter, materialized. Inside this globe were five beings with non-human features. They had hairless heads with oval, sunken eyes, and instead of noses, there were only slits. The most unsettling part was that they had no mouths. The communication with these beings was telepathic, and they repeated the message. We have made contact several times. The encounter was beyond anything I could comprehend, and I couldn't contain my fear. I screamed in terror, and in an instant the globe of light disappeared, leaving me in a state of shock. The experience left a profound impact on me, and I was so disconcerted that I sought psychiatric care for the next two years. The encounter with those enigmatic beings remains etched in my memory, a haunting and unexplainable event that still baffles me to this day. I was alone on my way home from vacation. I was driving a pickup pulling a camper. It was after 11 p.m. on a summer night. I was about two hours from home but wanted to get home, yet that night. I was traveling through a wooded area. It was about 50 miles of just trees on both sides of the road with an occasional house every five or so miles. I saw something move up ahead. I immediately slowed down, thinking there was a deer in the road. As I passed, I saw a young woman walking on the extreme shoulder near the ditch. She was walking with traffic. She had on knee-high socks. A very short, pleated-type cheerleader-type skirt and a halter top. She was tall with long brown hair. Since this was the middle of nowhere on a road that sees only a few cars per hour, I immediately assumed she was in some sort of trouble. Fight with a boyfriend and left stranded. Car trouble, etc. I was not going very fast at this point, so I pulled over at the emergency flashers, set the parking brake, grabbed the flashlight, and got out and went back to see if she needed assistance. When I got to the rear of the trailer, she was gone. I shined the flashlight up and down both sides of the road, the ditches and even the tree line, but saw no one. I drove the rest of the way home with the hair on the back of my neck standing on end. So I'm a 25 years old female, and this strange thing happened to me just this afternoon. I often take nice and relaxing strolls through the forest on Sundays together with my dad, which is some kind of tradition since my childhood, and today was no exception. Sometimes my uncle joins us on those strolls, and today he did so too. We walked down one of our usual paths, and at a split of the path, we met some old man my dad and uncle obviously knew. The man was walking the opposite direction back towards the village. They did some small talk, and then we headed further along the path through the forest, my dad and uncle being a bit ahead of me and talking to each other while I took some photos of the beautiful nature around us, in the process walking a bit slower than them and stopping a few times. There were a few times I was a good distance behind them, which at that point I didn't realize that it could have been dangerous. At some point on the path, we turned to head back home, and as we walked a bit, I stopped for a moment to take a picture of the trees next to the path. 
Then after taking the picture, I, for some reason, looked a bit left and was absolutely shocked the moment I turned my head because farther in the forest, leaned against one of the trees, stood that old man we'd met before, absolutely still, just staring intensely back at me without any movement and without saying a word. After the initial shock, I decided to just look away and keep on walking, not daring to look behind us most of the way back. I didn't tell my father or uncle about it, but it was just such a weird experience. What scares me the most about it is that I don't have any real explanation as to why that man had been following us, and even more why he was doing so, not on the path, but just within the forest. And if he didn't have anything creepy in mind, why he didn't say anything, but just stare. I'm just so glad that I wasn't walking alone. This happened almost 15 years ago when I was seven. My best friend's mom would babysit my brother and I before and after school. My mom would usually drop us off at her house around 6 a.m. She would make us breakfast, and the three of us would walk to our elementary that was less than 10 minutes away. For preface, we would walk through an adjacent neighborhood, through this small wooded area that had an enclosed bridge, and that led us to the back of our elementary. The elementary sits back in a long tree line that runs about half a mile north and another mile south. Anyways, we're about to get to the turn where we walk into the tree line to the bridge and this guy comes cruising down the street. At first, I don't even think we noticed him considering how young we were, but right when he's about 10 feet away from us, he slows down to virtually zero miles per hour. There was nothing that stood out about his appearance either. He was middle-aged, white male, very generic. Well, we all stare at the car and start walking super slowly. If we stop, he would stop. If we walk, he would slowly go. During this whole ordeal, he has a blank expression on his face. Not anger, no smirk, just this sinister deadness, almost. This went on for probably five minutes because we were too scared he'd jump out of the car if we turned our backs on him and I was mainly scared for my little brother. Finally, he speeds off, and we run the rest of the way to school. Immediately go to the principal's office, and at this point, we're bawling. We gave them our version of the story, his description, and whatever else a seven-year-old is actually capable of giving. They take action by calling the cops and our parents. The cops come, and we explain where it happened in the story again. Then our parents ended up taking us out of school. From then on, we weren't allowed to walk to school anymore, and our babysitter would take us. The reason this ended up being so creepy is because, apparently, there had been reports around that time of a guy who would sit under the bridge we walked over right by the school and watch people. They didn't know if he was homeless or if it was this other guy who we encountered. They never caught the guy, and we never saw him again. Whether this was a more sinister encounter than we thought, or he was just bored. We will never know. I do know how bizarre it was, though. Who stares at children that intently while driving by? He even turned his head around as he was driving. By his chance of luck, no other cars drove by during this whole situation. But weirdo driver, let's not ever meet again. I went to college in the prairie country of Minnesota. There wasn't a whole lot of public ground, but there were a few pretty large swamps that kept people out. Scouting the edge of the corn in October, I found an absolutely torn up corner of the field next to one of these swamps. Great rubs everywhere, and a trail straight through the marsh leading back to a strip of trees on the only high ground around. I came back with my waters and a few climbing sticks the next week, and... After about a half-mile walk through Nita chest-deep swamp, made it out and up into a medium-sized oak for an evening sight. Saw a monster buck, but that's another story. Shooting time came and went, and just as I'm lowering my bow down, I hear the most blood-chilling sound I've heard in the woods. I can only describe it as a mountain lion crossed with someone being murdered, along with growling, hissing, and crashing. It first started about 50 yards off, an 
Of course, as darkness fell, the sound inched closer and closer to my tree. At this point, I'm losing it, trying to convince myself the odds of a cougar this far south are pretty slim, but that didn't help thinking about what the alternatives might be. Well, it finally reached my tree, and I was able to light it up with my phone flash. Last week, I decided to go camping at a nearby national park. I'm an experienced camper, and I had camped this particular spot dozens of times. I parked in the designated parking spot for campers and grabbed my gear. I headed off into the wilderness. I normally like to get away from people. I can cover 20 miles in a day, but I don't normally do that every time. I had been walking for about five hours, so I was a five-hour hike from my car. I knew I was far from the normal tourists and family gatherings. That was my intention. It was close to sundown and was starting to get dark. Walking along the trail in the forest, it gets pitch black really quickly. I had not seen another person for a few hours. I had a pretty good idea that I was alone, and the chances of coming across another camper were small, as late as it was and as far off as I was. I was walking to where I was going to set up my tent for the night, and I could only see about ten feet in front of me, and it was getting darker by the minute. Eventually it would be pitch black. There are no lights out there off the grid. Normally the only light is from your fire or flashlight or a cell phone. As I was walking, I heard what sounded like footsteps coming just beyond my available light, off in the trees about forty yards away. I stopped to listen and try to figure out what it was. I stood there scanning the distance, but the noise had stopped. I then spotted what looked like a dark figure standing behind or next to a tree. I couldn't tell which. Whatever it was was just standing there. I couldn't make out the shape very well, so I thought it was a deer. I stood there quiet looking at it. I have to admit, being alone and so far from any help, I was a little spooked. I've heard stories of murderers who attack unsuspecting campers or hikers in some national parks because of how vast the area is and how vulnerable the people are being far away from civilians. I stood there for a few minutes, scared that it was going to start coming towards me. I was not sure what it was. I didn't know if it was a wild animal. Those can attack humans, too. I decided to turn around, keeping my eyes on the mysterious dark figure. I was scared that it was going to follow me. I knew I couldn't walk all night, five hours back to my car in the dark. I was tired, and I didn't want to make any light. My plan was to stay quiet and lay on the ground until dawn. I would sleep if everything was kosher. I walked about a football field away until I could not see it and unrolled my sleeping bag. I laid there looking in that direction and listening. About 45 minutes went by and I heard the footsteps in the distance. My heart began racing because I could not see anything at this point. I didn't know if it was an animal. Whatever it was would take a few steps and stop, take a few steps and stop, over and over. I couldn't see but from the direction of the noise, whatever it was walked to my side about 15 yards away, then crossed in front of me, then stopped. It was very close. My heart was beating so fast. I was sure it could hear me breathe. It kept going as it crossed in front of me and walked further away. Whatever it was, it had come very close to me. I laid there too scared to move. I couldn't hear anything. For all I knew, it was standing still right by me. I heard no noises, no human sounds or animal, only the sound of leaves and sticks being walked on. From the time that it crossed in front of me and headed off away from me, and the time I couldn't hear anything, I managed to get my nerves enough to get up and keep walking back to my car. I did not hear or see anything since hearing it come close to me as it crossed my path and head off in the other direction. I ate to my car, and there were other cars. The sun was close to coming up, and I fell asleep in my car. I could hear people talking and kids laughing as I slept, so I knew it was okay. I know not any blood and guts, but still very creepy. I still don't know what it was. Could have been an animal. I'm just glad that it didn't find me.
I remember the time when I was in second grade returning to school from my lunch hour. As I walked near a clump of trees in a field, I encountered a strange little figure about my own height, standing at just under four feet. The figure had an unusual greenish tone to its skin and was barefoot. Next to it was a round thing from which I assumed the entity had emerged, although I didn't witness this happening. The entity started jabbering at me in a language I couldn't understand. It then took out an object from a belt around its waist, resembling some kind of gun, and squirted a putty-like substance into the palm of its hand. I noticed that the entity had long fingernails that looked like claws. It handed the putty to me, and I was confused by the whole encounter, so I started to move away. When I turned back to look again, both the man and the object had vanished mysteriously. Later on, I confided the bizarre story to one of my teachers. They questioned me about the putty which I showed them. The putty was yellowish with green flecks, about one, eighth inch thick and roughly the size of a golf ball. It had a quite hard texture. As I was about to leave, the teacher noticed the object on the ground nearby. It seemed to have definitely shrunk in size. I put it back in my pocket, and that was the last anyone saw of it. I live in the northern end region of Germany's Black Forest, and even though the region is nothing in comparison to United States rural areas, or even rural German areas, it still has. It's quiet and dark roads. So I'm at a school event that went on until late night, you could call it a prom kind of thing, and I take the last bus to my village at 1, 36 a.m. in the town where my school is. The bus ride takes 30 minutes, and we're a good 20 minutes into the ride. Aside from me, the driver, and one guy who was almost at sleep, the bus is empty as the road we're driving on. It's the forest stretch right before my village, and it's pitch black. Nothing to see. The bus comes around a corner, and in the middle of the road is a vehicle, gray Audi A3, with hazards on and both front doors open. The bus driver brakes hardly and comes to a stop right behind the car. Nobody to see. Nothing to hear. Just the engines running. The bus driver turns around in his seat and opens his mouth to speak when suddenly this woman comes out of the woods, running towards the bus doors. Bus driver, sleepy, or now awake. Guy and I just watch as she starts to hammer against the bus doors, screaming like some kind of animal. Bus driver slams into reverse and then drives away, almost slamming the driver door of the car. We speed through the forest and at the first stop. In civilization, he phones the police and some of his colleagues to inform them. I still don't know what the hell was going on there, but... I've heard from friends that they've seen similar things, gray Audi with hazards on, in various parts of the county they and I live in. Still creeps me out, and I normally try to take the bus earlier than midnight or sleep over when I'm away. In the 90s, I was on a week-long backpacking trip with my uncle in the Colorado high country. He was a professional rock climbing trail guide at the time, so he knew his stuff while off the grid. The second day in, we were following some old trail that hadn't been groomed in years and came across the outskirts of some random commune deep in the woods. We knew there were people there because we could see campfires and laughing or talking in the distance. My uncle immediately freaks out tells me to keep quiet, and then made us backtrack nearly five miles and then around. It was the first and only time I've actually seen him panic off, the good. Afterward, he lectured me that it was some kind of small sect or cult that had a rep for being very territorial in the area at the time, and was known to shoot at trespassers without provocation. I've been a hunter all my life, so it was supposed to be a routine grouse hunt, just me and the tranquility of nature, but as I ventured deeper into the woods, the atmosphere changed. 
The trees grew denser, and sunlight struggled to penetrate the canopy, leaving me in an eerie, darkened realm. My instincts urged me to turn back, but something pushed me forward. Curiosity, perhaps, or a hint of excitement in exploring the unknown. With each step, I felt the forest closing in around me, its silence broken only by the occasional rustle of leaves or the distant cry of a bird. Little did I know that my journey was about to take a surreal and terrifying turn. As I followed the winding path, I suddenly caught sight of a massive figure in the distance. It was like nothing I had ever seen before. Towering at least nine feet tall, with wide shoulders and muscles rippling beneath its stringy hair, the creature moved with a grace that defied its size. Its long arms swayed rhythmically, and its powerful thighs propelled it forward, like an ancient predator prowling the shadows. Trying to comprehend what I was witnessing, my mind fumbled for words to describe the monstrosity before me. A half-gorilla and half-neanderthal man-type animal was the closest I could come to describing its unsettling features. It had hardly any discernible neck, and its head tapered to a cone. Like point, the creature's presence exuded raw power and primal intelligence, making me acutely aware of my own vulnerability. Fear and adrenaline surged through me, but my hunter's instincts kicked in. My heart pounded as I aimed my rifle at the creature, steadying my breath to take the shot. I had to protect myself, but more importantly, I needed to know what this creature was, where it came from, and what it meant for the natural order of things. With a deep breath, I pulled the trigger. The shot echoed through the forest, and I watched the bullet hurtle towards the unknown beast. For a split second, it seemed like my bullet had found its mark, but my hope was crushed as I saw the projectile bounce harmlessly off the creature's skin. It was as if the skin was made of some impenetrable armor, rendering my weapon useless. The creature didn't even flinch. It stared at me with eyes that seemed to pierce my very soul. But before I could react further, it vanished into the forest, blending seamlessly with the shadows. I stood there, dumbfounded and perplexed, unable to process what had just transpired. Nothing in my hunting experience could explain what I had encountered. Was this some ancient, mythical creature long believed to be extinct, or had it emerged from the depths of the earth itself, a harbinger of a new and untamed era? As I made my way back to civilization, the forest felt different, changed. The woods that had once been familiar and comforting now held secrets that sent shivers down my spine. I shared my bizarre encounter with fellow hunters and researchers, but most dismissed it as a figment of my imagination or an exaggeration. It was 2014 and I was eight years old. I don't remember the exact month, but I'm pretty sure it was December. Strange things had happened in the house in the previous days, strange shadows and continuous nightmares while I slept, which is why I always slept with my mother that year. I don't remember the exact date it happened. However, that evening my father was working the night shift, so my mother and I were home alone. My mother was sleeping next to me, and I woke her up telling her there was something in the corridor, because I heard noises. She said it was just the wind and turned back to sleep. I couldn't sleep, and after the umpteenth noise, I opened my eyes. In front of me, to the side, and in front of the cot where my mother slept, was a gray figure with thin legs and thin arms. It held up one arm to indicate something, with the hand parallel to my mother's face which was turned onto the back of the bed. I closed my eyes, hoping it was a nightmare. Then I opened them again, and it was still there. Lying in bed, it seemed to reach up to the door handle, which is next to my bed, so it was not higher than 60, 70 centimeter. Perhaps it really was taller, and it was because of the perspective that it seemed short to me. At that point, I closed my eyes, and now that I think about it, stupidly enough, I reached out to try and feel that thing. I wanted to see if it was real or if I was dreaming. My hand touched something sharp and cold, and I spun around, closing my eyes. I don't know if what I touched was the thing or the metal frame of the cot, 
but I think it was the frame. A few minutes later, I turned around and opened the thing was gone, so I figured it was all a dream, and then decided to sleep. Suddenly, inches from my nose, a round gray thing appears in front of the headboard. I start to scream, but no sound comes out of my mouth, so I blink, and the round thing is gone. I try to fall back asleep and succeed, but I don't know if I was abducted afterwards, or if it was all a figment of my imagination. After that, still in that period, end of 2014, beginning of 2015, when I was trying to fall asleep, I remember that my father was also in the house. I heard a voice saying, ah, food. I never understood what it was. Over the years, I've thought several times that it was my father who watched something on the phone before falling asleep. However, I couldn't close my eyes all night. Three other similar cases have occurred. Once I saw a dark shadow breathing heavily beyond the door that separates the living room and the corridor, which is made of opaque glass. Another happened the following year, when I was changing in my room, and I heard a growl from the corridor. I immediately closed the bedroom door without reopening it until my parents arrived. The last one happened two years ago after I fought with my father. While I was alone in the room, I jokingly said, Aliens, can't you kidnap him for a few days? And I received a hoarse and disturbing no as an answer. I still remember it like it was yesterday. I didn't just see shadows. Three years ago in August, while I was in the courtyard at about four in the afternoon, I saw a gray figure materializing out of nowhere. The figure trudged a few steps in wide strides before disappearing after stepping onto the first step to ascend up to the house. It was slightly shorter than a person with long arms and legs. I remember it had four fingers and it stared at me before vanishing. I will never forget that look, a white toothed smile and almond eyes. My folks were next to me looking in the same direction, but they saw nothing. When I told them what I had seen, they said it was just a trick of the lights. I also was touched and perhaps about to be kidnapped. At the age of 10, something grabbed my head and dragged me out of bed. I woke up screaming and putting my hands on my head. I had time to touch a pair of wrinkled hands before my parents woke up and the hands let me go. My parents came to see what had happened, finding me on the floor groggy. They told me it was just a nightmare, but I'm sure it wasn't. I had the last experience last August on a Wednesday at midnight or noon. I watched Netflix on my computer while playing games on my phone. The light from the computer quickly illuminated a hand, seemingly connected to nothingness, trying to touch me just above my left knee. Without telling my sleeping parents and without shouting, I turned on the lights immediately, but whatever it was was gone. My mother had similar experiences to the first I related to. Once she saw a short, huge-headed humanoid figure spying on her and my uncle from the front door to their bedroom, the second time, a similar figure spying on her from behind a radiator on the corner on the way to my grandma's sister's house, which is attached to my grandma's by a corridor full of windows. He never told me when the second happened, but the first happened at night. Another thing about my mom is that she always sees a black figure before a family member dies. She says it's death, and I believe her. He saw her before my great-grandfather passed away, then before my great-grandmother passed away, and last time in 2020, one at the end of May, about a week before my grandfather died of a heart attack. My grandmother and her sister also had weird experiences, shortly after my grandfather's death, from the corridor going to my grandmother's sister's house, for a few nights they saw a bright red dot floating in the sky. It rose above the horizon, moving up to the chimney of the house closest to them, to then rise into the sky and disappearing over my grandmother's house. I don't know why they never took pictures. They say it was a drone or a Chinese lantern. But I don't think a Chinese lantern takes the exact same route some nights in a row. Maybe it really was a drone, though, but not having seen it and the two of them not being very adept at identifying modern technology. I can't be sure. 
My grandmother's sister had the last experience I want to tell you about back in 1960. She never told me the exact year or month. At the time, she was still living in Old Gate Camasco, Italy, the birthplace of my mother's maternal branch, with my great-grandmother. She was coming home from work, and night had just fallen. To get home from where he worked at the time, she usually passed through a wood that has now been replaced by a few houses. On the dirt road, he punctured a wheel on the bike he usually used to travel there. A few minutes after she started shuffling behind her bike, she saw lights in a clearing, and never scared easily, she approached. A similar event had also happened a few days earlier, but it was explained as the lights of a demonstration or a discotheque that opened in a small village near his home, whose name I don't recall, and I don't know if it still exists. What he found in the clearing, however, was a series of stationary lights within which other series of lights spun in opposite directions. These lights then suddenly turned off when she got home. My great-grandmother asked why it had taken so long. My grandmother's sister, looking at the watch on her wrist, saw it was 11.30 p.m. This is when she normally gets home around 9 p.m. She told my great-grandmother everything, but I don't know what happened next. She never wanted to know what had happened to her. Near where my grandmother and my grandmother's sister grew up is Lake Como, Italy, and several times they have seen what they call heat lightning, basically ball lightning. And they said that the red ball they saw wasn't a ball lightning because it lasted too long and was always the same. And my aunt said it's impossible for so many and as big as the lights she had seen in the 60s to form. I live in the suburbs of Abbiate Grasso, province of Milan, Italy. This is located just next to the Ticino Triangle, perhaps the hot spot with the most UFO sightings in northern Italy. Nearby are the Camry military base and the state powder magazine in Romando. So I don't typically believe in this kind of stuff, but I had a very strange encounter a while back. I told my co-workers about it, and they insisted I had seen a rake. I've been researching since I had no idea what it was. It looks very similar to what I saw, except it's a fictional creature from a creepypasta. Just learned about that, too, so I'm not sure what I saw. Anyway, I was driving home from work about a month or so ago and headed down this typically busy side street in Douglas County, Colorado, called Havana. It's close to Centennial Airport in a business district surrounded by apartments. It was about 1, 30 I'm, and there wasn't much traffic, just a jeep in front of me. As I drove around a bend in the road where Dry Creek turns into Havana, I saw in my peripheral vision a figure to my right on the sidewalk standing between two small trees held up by wire supports. The creature stood kind of behind them. At first glance, I figured it was just a tall, slender dog like a white greyhound or Great Dane. It escaped and seemed to bark at traffic on the sidewalk. I was traveling about 45 miles per hour when I passed, and it was dark out but I noticed as I passed by that it appeared to have a humanoid-shaped head with black eyes. It also had a bent-over hunched back, long, slender legs, and an unusually wide mouth like it was screaming or something. I thought to myself, Yo, what was that? So I slowed down quickly to look back, and in my mirror, I saw the creature turn around and run off towards a fence or brick-retaining wall on the other side of the sidewalk. But as it ran off, I saw how tall and slender the creature was. It seemed very pale, almost gray, with an anorexic and bony appearance. It also moved strangely where its hind leg joints were inverted and bent in the opposite direction from its front legs. At that point, I was seriously creeped out. The jeep in front of me had also slowed down, so I could only assume they saw it too. We both continued driving as it was late or early and couldn't stop in the middle of a busy road. However, that situation really made my skin crawl. I checked my mirrors for the rest of the drive home. I debated if I should call a non-emergency line to have an officer check it out, but I told myself they would think I was an idiot. 
Now, every night when I take that road, I look around to see if I can spot it again. I really want to believe it was just a dog. However, I can't stop thinking about how strange and quickly it moved with its backwards knees and how long or wide its mouth stretched. I haven't talked about this much except to some family and my, my co-workers because, frankly, it sounds ridiculous. I'm wondering what I saw and if it's something I should talk about or should I pretend I never saw anything and move on with my life? Navajos growing up on the reservation hear about skinwalkers from time to time. For this reason, nearly everyone is cautious about who they trust or what kinds of things they talk about, because Yenayad Lucias are dangerous people that have the abilities of animals, yet retain their cunning human minds. My mother has many tales to tell of Yenayad Lucias skinwalkers. She tells us because she wants us to be aware that there are people out there that may want to hurt us or play with our minds. She sometimes tells it to assure me that there is a God and he watches over everyone, even little Navajo children. This true story, which happened in the 1960s, is one of them. One night she and her four sisters, my aunts, were at home after a long day of shepherding and doing chores. My mom and her sister needed to use the bathroom before going to bed, and so they decided to go to the outhouse together. They didn't have plumbing back then, or running water as they were living in a traditional hogan. The outhouse was far away, and they didn't want to walk there alone in the darkness, so they decided to go together. It was relatively late. The sole light source was moonlight. As the two finally neared the outhouse, they thought they heard some faint sounds like that of whistling. It was bird-like, but whoever was whistling was following them and was circling the area. They clung to each other, chilled by the sound, and continued on. Oddly enough, the outhouse door was open. Usually, when people use the outhouse, they always latch or wire the door shut. As they came close enough to the outhouse, they saw a large black thing sitting inside. Though they couldn't see its features, they could make out that it was human in nature. Terrified, they screamed in horror and ran back to the Hogan as fast as their legs could carry them. They could hear someone chasing them from behind and that it was gaining on them. As soon as they reached the Hogan, they dashed in and slammed the door. They hurriedly told their other sisters what happened, and they sat in silence waiting for something to happen. The Hogan door wasn't secure. It was only an old, worn-down door with no knob. It had a rickety latch nailed to the inside of the door to keep it closed. Nothing was barring the smoke hole where the chimney rose out. It was open to the air, and you could see the night sky. The person outside began banging on the walls, making all five of them huddle in the middle of the room near the stove. There were heavy objects being thrown now, and a lot of noise. Soon they heard it climb onto the roof. Whoever it was was walking back and forth, and every now and then it, it would peer through the smoke hole at them, its face hidden by darkness. There were adults present, but being a rather rude foster family with kids of their own, they lived in another Hogan some distance away. Though they tried calling out to them, they became angry and didn't answer. Finally, in pure desperation, my mom's three older sisters, being raised Catholic in boarding school, told her and her younger sister to get down on their knees. They began praying to God for protection. One of them had acquired holy water from the church, and she sprinkled it near the door. All night, the skinwalker would circle the hogan, pound on the door, and make that whistling noise, but even though the hogan was improperly secured, that skinwalker never got to break in and hurt them. My mom never found out who tried to hurt them that night. Medicine men can hold a chant for you to see who tried to hurt you, but this was never carried out. Looking back on it now, my mom says that nobody was protecting them that night. Nobody but Heavenly Father, and that he kept them safe from harm's way. The Yenayad Lucias would bother them off and on, but not once were they harmed. When my now wife and I first started dating, 
We would take long walks through our very small town after I got off work at 11 p.m. We would wander through the cemetery down little country roads everywhere. But our favorite area was a large field where the stars were incredible. One night we were watching a small meteor shower and heard all kinds of loud grunting and ruckus coming from a tree line. We had nowhere to go and were starting to get concerned. A large, angry Bigfoot came out, stared at us, and then quietly walked away. I don't think we breathed for several minutes. I was convinced he was coming at us, and there was no way to outrun him. We didn't go back there for a few days. I drove to a park to go hiking at night in the mountains. So safe, I know. And I hadn't even turned off my car, and I already feel like I'm being watched. There weren't any cars around, so I thought maybe it was just me being paranoid for some reason. But for some reason, I look to my right, and I see this weird-looking humanoid shape on top of the little bump hill about 50 feet away. At first, I thought it was a weirdly shaped tree until I saw the arms move. No wind at all. So now I know there's a person staring at my car trying not to move for what I assume is for me to get out of my car and leave to a more secluded area as we were next to the road. Of course I left. I don't go hiking at night in that particular park anymore. I had received reports of a bunch of noise at the far northeastern section of the park. I was personally called to investigate myself. I brought it to the ranger in charge at the time, and he agreed it would be a good idea for me to go idea for me to go out there during patrols. I took it upon myself to join the other ranger on patrol that evening. The reports were something of screaming at them from behind the trees along one stretch of road near the campsite for several nights in a row. It was described as sounding vaguely human, but also not human. There were two male witnesses, and I made it my mission to speak with them myself. When we got into that section of the park, it was getting dark. By the time we reached where they'd been camping previously, it seemed like it might take us a little while to find any evidence since it had been about three days. Since those initial reports, the ranger I was with, whom we'll call Frank, and I split up. He headed off to the left, and I headed off to the right, where it seemed like there would be less dense vegetation. I continued walking, calling out intermittently, hoping to find somebody, assuming they were behind the screaming. I would call back every few minutes, and Frank replied, saying he was on his way back, but found nothing so far. I got about another 200 yards in, when all of a sudden it sounded like something nearby had crashed through some brush, running. Now, normally, this wouldn't have been an issue, except it sounded like a very large biped coming towards us. I immediately started heading back in the direction of the vehicle, not really wanting to see what was coming. It didn't take a genius to realize that what it sounded like was coming for me. Once I heard this, I did my best to bet run what could turn out to be a bear, or maybe a mountain lion, or maybe worst of all, what others had considered a Sasquatch previously. Before departing from camp that night, Frank had joined me just as we reached our vehicle parked roughly 80 yards away from where he'd been searching when he responded earlier. By this point, there were loud noises everywhere around us, making it impossible now to hear each other without speaking very loudly. The forest was alive with these screams. I quickly suggested we get back into the vehicle. I was not waiting around. We immediately started driving back towards Base Ops, which was about 15 minutes away from where we were currently stationed on patrol. My heart was racing the entire time. The forest and the night were alive with these creatures or something going on. I was told to write up a detailed report of what had happened to us out there and even gave detailed sketches of the creature that I saw that night. Even though I barely did, Frank, however, was questioned. He had very well seen the creatures I did not see between the fear and the shaking. It took quite a bit of time for him to convince himself that he was not hallucinating and that he did indeed see something dangerous. 
This was all eventually resolved when we decided and were told not to talk about it. I think we, as rangers, accepted that there might be some theories about the mythical Bigfoot and that they are indeed a reality. Of course, this only led to more questions and speculation than actually having fruitful full answers. Let's just say we finished our patrols without incident after that and shared stories of other strange things happening. I'm pretty sure that made believers out of us. At least it did for me. Let me share with you this true story. One day my family and I were driving down a road bordered by a whole bunch of woods. As we were driving, something caught my eye in a nearby field. At first glance, it seemed like a bear, but upon closer inspection, I realized it was not a bear at all. The creature stood tall, about eight to ten feet, according to my dad, with the grass reaching up to its knees. We had a clear view of it for about seven to ten seconds. Startled, I exclaimed, Guys, did you see that? To my surprise, my dad responded, Wait, you saw that too? The creature was covered head to toe in thick four-inch long hair, standing on two legs like a human. After returning home, my dad and I decided to venture back to the same area the following day to investigate further. And believe it or not, we stumbled upon a 17-inch long footprint. Intrigued, we spent 45 minutes exploring the woods, and the area seemed like a suitable habitat for a big foot. That day, I became convinced that what I had witnessed was indeed a big foot. Near Strasburg, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, August 1978, afternoon. Three Amish men were working in their field when a strange-looking man approached them from a neighboring farm. The man was yelling and jumping about. The Amish men were alarmed and noticed that this man had arms, legs, and a face that seemed different, more animal than human. He had coarse dark hair on his limbs and face and wore dark and tattered boxer shorts. As a man, creature approached closer, he yelled something but it was not understood by the men. The men ran towards their house. The man, creature, was behind them. One of the Amish men ducked into the dairy barn, and the other two immediately entered the house. An elderly Amish woman who had been in the garden came to see what was taking place on. When the man, creature, saw her, it stopped running, sat down on the grass, and stared at the sky. The men came out of the house, and one slowly walked over to the man creature and attempted to talk to it. The man creature continued to look at the sky, but muttered. The man and woman noticed that a horrible stench permeated from this creature, described as rotting flesh. After several minutes, the creature got to its feet and walked towards the dairy barn. As it did, witnesses noticed that the creature was fading away. Eventually, it vanished from view just before it reached the barn. Shocked, the Amish witnesses dropped to their knees not knowing what they had witnessed. At the time this happened, I lived near St. Louis, Missouri, with my daughter and my husband. My daughter, her friend, and I had gone to a local mall to do some shopping before school started. We were walking out of one of the stores, and there were some people walking in at the same time. I happened to glance up and notice one of the women walking in. Her true face had shone through her human skin. It was the face of a brown horse, with the shape of the horse's head morphed under the woman's long, dark hair. When she noticed that I saw her true form, she snapped her head around and stared at me as I walked away. I was telling my daughter and her friend what I saw and what was happening, but they just laughed and did not believe me. Please tell me someone else has seen something like this, and I am not the only one. I can't forget what I saw that day. I wish I could draw, but I can't. Please, someone tell me that they are seeing something like this. It was at the Chesterfield Mall in Chesterfield, Missouri in 2012. I have experienced many paranormal encounters in the past, but this one is near the top of the list. 
The only times I've ever smelled anything were the few times I smelled cinnamon all around me while no one else did. It happened in my home as well as in bars. And in the car, I have also smelled a strong odor of cigarettes around me. Others could smell it in our home. None of us smoke and all windows were closed. My son and three other men were over a mile off the main road on the Cape Fear River fishing all afternoon just before dark. My son wandered into the woods to maybe spot deer feeding in the afternoon. I decided to walk up the two rut-muddy road-thick woods on both sides to the main road because fishing was slow. The guys had a fire right on the river bank, and so I told them I will be back in a while. As I was walking along the road, I was hearing lots of scurrying the woods on both sides. I had no flashlight and thought, man, there are a lot of deer around because this area is known for lots of wildlife. As I made it along, I was unnerved at the sounds in the forest. So I found myself steady looking to maybe see what I thought was deer, and maybe it was. The woods were really dark. The road leads to a field which is maybe 200 yards or more wide, just short of the main road, as I came up on the hill to the edge of the field. I was shocked to see three large orange balls moving down towards the ground and towards myself, and they stopped just over the trees, maybe a mile away or closer, and hovered there. I knew it was not natural. I am a commercial pilot, and I know aircraft. I stood in shock, thinking this cannot be real. I stayed maybe 10 to 15 minutes, then began to feel nervous, so I made my way back to the men on the river in a hurry mud and all. I then, in a panic, took off looking for my son, which was 17 years old at the time. And as I started into the woods calling him, he came towards me, totally shaken, telling me, Dad, you will never believe me, but I have been hiding from aliens. I am scared they are in the woods, and I believed at that time. He had seen something he was serious. I told him, Junior, I just saw three orange UFOs up at the road, and it scared me, so I came looking for you. We made it back to the river, and my son, excited, began to tell the other three men what he had seen, and they started on the both of us. What I did not know was the three of them saw the same thing as my son during that time, the sequence. I am not sure, but we all saw the same. It was a clear, cold night. Stars were bright, and about that time, one of the other men holding a fishing pole hollered, look up, and to all our amazement, the stars looked as if six to eight of them from different parts of the sky moved very fast, seeming to converge in a group. And then all of a sudden, three of the objects side by side came over our heads and landed, or went out of sight on the other side of the river. Maybe two to four hundred yards away, all three lights were round, bright white, blinding lights as big as maybe 100 yards in diameter, all side by side, all touching down or going out of sight in the forest, just on the other side of the river. It scared all of us so bad, the three friends of mine, along with my son and me, dropped our fishing pole, screaming, Let's go home. We left fire poles and all speeding up the muddy road to the main road, each one in a panic. Some of the men were fussing. Take me home first. I need to find my wife and children. When we made it to the top of the hill, this is where the tree is on both sides end and the field starts. I slammed on the brakes, all of us, in shock to see what looked like a brilliant white egg-shaped sphere with a tail with long spikes all around the middle. In front section, hovering 20 feet over the main road, 200 yards from us and it looked as if it, or the spiked part of it, was making slow revolution. This, I tell you, this is true. Four grown men as old as fifty, and my seventeen-year-old son was frozen in my truck, looking at this thing straight in front of us. The lights were brilliant white. The object then appeared to raise up, started down the road in the direction that we intended to go, and then it shot off just over the trees, out of sight. The three orange balls were no longer there. All five of us were terrified. We raced it on his home first. He ran to the door, his wife came out, and we all told her of the story, and we're all looking at the sky. Jean, who was fifty years old, lived next door. 
We ran him home and then raced to David's home. His wife came out to meet us, and all of us witnessed strange lights over the trees behind his home. My son and I started home to see cars stopped alongside of the road looking at the same lights. We made it home and was terrified, trying to calm down. We found ourselves sitting in what we call as the red room, which is my private study off of my bedroom on the rear of the home, staring out the window at the sky. I live on six acres of land, and we have a large dog kennel just in the woods behind my home, and a Chesapeake Bay Retriever, which lives on my back steps, a guard dog. She lets us know if anything from a person to a squirrel is on our property. We were home maybe four hours, calmed down a lot. No TV didn't have one at that time. I guess it was around 1 to 2 a.m., and there was a noise that sounded sort of like a prop jet flew treetop high over the house. I ran outside and could see nothing. Within 30 to 45 minutes, all the dogs in the kennel were roaring. They are all hounds, and they will tell you when there is something there that is not supposed to be. At that time, my retriever was going crazy hair, standing up on her back, barking towards the kennel. My son was scared, but I convinced him to go with me to see what had the dog stirred up. My son and I opened the door, and the retriever took off you see. She most of the time will not leave the patio unless I go out if she is stirred up. There was frost on the ground, didn't even have shoes on. We took off behind her, and she ran just behind the kennels, and all the dogs were roaring, and she was here standing up barking at something in the bushes along with all the other dogs in the kennel, and then she took off after whatever it was, and so my son and I ran back down the road that leads to the kennel to my backyard, at the very rear of the property, trying to cut off whatever it was she was chasing. When I got to the blueberry hedgerow, which at the very rear of the property, she was still a dog making her way to me in a roaring like panic. At that time, I stopped not really scared, but kind of numb to see this max of four tall creature person, alien, staring at me. It looked as if it had a clear glass-like covering around it. It appeared to have a faint glow of red and black, the face I could not see anything but what looked like it had a red set of goggles and a black or dark covering over the lower part of its face, sort of like a mask. The body appeared to sort of glow. I can probably draw it better than explain it. It then disappeared just as my son, and the dog got right up on it, and my son then told me, you see, I am not crazy. This was the same description as he told everyone. I will not go into detail, but my son and I were committed to an insane asylum by our family because they really thought we were crazy. We were released within two days, and then my father came to me and apologized when he said he had heard on the radio and the news that lots of people had been seeing strange lights, and that the government reported that a Soviet satellite had fallen that same night. I am 45 years old, with four children, churchgoer, retired builder, and commercial pilot. I have been ridiculed, committed, along with my son, and oppressed to say anything. But I know what I saw, and four other men will say the same. I have been since hooked on UFO files trying to find others that have had the same experience. I will take a lie detector, be hypnotized whatever, to bring the truth to the public. My son and the other three men all saw the same and have their own accounts. When I was 12, we moved from Alaska to North Carolina. My mom didn't fly, so we bought a tiny camper and camped for two weeks going across Canada. We were having trouble with the brake lights, so we found a campground and pulled in. No one was at the gate to check us in, so we just parked close to the gate, thinking we'd pay once the host arrived. The first thing I did was take off on my bike around the loop. I noticed that every camper had a car beside it, but no people. There were no people anywhere. I rode back to get my mom to go to the bathroom with me because I was creeped out. My mom loved anything scary and also loved trying to scare me. There was a door in the bathroom that looked like it was like a janitor's closet. She flung the door open dramatically and, and screeched, trying to scare me only to realize it wasn't a closet but a set of stairs to a dark nowhere. 
She slammed the door closed, and we got out of there. Back at the camper, my mom was telling my dad about the door to nowhere, and he said that the toilet flushed beside him while he was in the bathroom, but no one else was in there with him. We had two dogs with us, and they would stretch their necks up and sniff the air and whine. It's getting to be dinner time. Still not one person. And my mom starts making up a story about how the campers are vampires, and they wait for new campers to come, and then they eat them. I shit you, not as soon as the sun went behind the trees. Everyone came out of their campers. We packed up and got the hell out of there. My girlfriend and I had a cryptid sighting along Route 40, just north of Brookville. The sun was still up, just a little before sunset, with thin, high clouds, so there was plenty of light. I was driving, and she was looking at me as we were heading west on 40, engaged in conversation. Then I saw her eyes widen as she gazed past me through my window. She practically screamed, what the hell is that, and pointed across the field we were traveling parallel to. I looked to my left and saw something huge and black with a massive upper body running like a bat out of hell along the edge of the woods. She watched it for a good thirty seconds as it ran along the edge of the woods until we lost sight of it when we passed a house close to the road. She kept going on about it, half panicked and excited until we got home, which took about three, four minutes from the point of the sighting. Finally, we got home, and I asked her what she saw exactly. She described it as a big black thing that was running faster than any deer or human could move. It had a big upper body, but we couldn't see any major details due to the distance across the field. She said it was one of those things, wasn't it? After the encounter, I introduced her to the NADP site, but I also asked her if she had seen anything strange in that area before, like animals acting oddly or going missing and she confirmed that such incidents had occurred over time. So, this is my dogman sighting. On July 4th, 2012, at 2 p.m., I saw a dogman cross my path in front of my bicycle. This beast was only four feet away from me. Its snout was over a foot long with absolutely ferocious teeth. Where we typically have whites in the eyes, this one had yellow. The inner part of the eye was green and had a very piercing appearance. I would approximate this animal's weight to be about 220 pounds. This isn't late night hikers. It was my mom taking six-year-old me for a walk while we were camping in Washington back in the late 80s. We were Canadians on vacation and didn't know the area. It was just us, walking along the banks of the river at dusk and playing in the trees when I remember starting to feel. Weird, like someone was following us. I thought maybe my dad was playing games with us. Except it was pretty clear my mom felt the same way because she started hissing at me to walk faster and be quiet. The feeling got stronger and stronger and... Then I felt my mom grab my hand and tell me to run. We just kept running until we hit a road and flagged down a car who took this petrified mother and daughter to their campground. The name of the river? The Green River. They found another victim of the Green River killer, Gary Ridgway, a few weeks later, in the area where we were exploring. It has ruined my ability to walk through the woods by myself. The woods by where my father grew up have an old abandoned house, or houses, I should say, scattered throughout the woods. I'm from the Hudson Valley. Anyone from that area knows the woods there have old houses, or at least the foundations remaining. Anyway, when my father was younger, he and everyone else basically would climb up this mountain to an abandoned house. He said it had old black and white nudes, but a lot of kids would go up to smoke and hang out, so a lot of the things were just smashed. Part of the trip up the mountain basically involved climbing up a cliff, blanking on proper term, just a flat rock surface that you had to scale. This was also his usual way down. 
So one night he went up alone and was working his way down. Night was settling in, and as he was lowering himself down the drop-off, he felt an odd presence and glanced upwards towards where he was just standing. Basically what he saw was a quick glance, because whatever it was just made him climb down the mountain and run home. He described it as basically very tall, lumbering above him and covered in hair. It wasn't a bear, at least from the glance he got. Normally, you'd take things to your parents and tell you if you have some doubt. But after a recent trip to his mother's and her sharing some of his stories that he told, it just made it more believable. There's also that hole you'll see what you want to see, so who knows. I'm terrified of heavily wooded areas, to be honest. I'm a pretty avid runner. I've been quitting a lot of bad habits, and exercise just does the trick for me. I have a greenway behind my house that I can run or bike on. It's very beautiful, and during the day, plenty of people are there. Well, about a week ago, I ran through the greenway to stop by a friend's house and grab something. By the time I got back onto the greenway, the sun was already starting to set, and the path was getting dark. As I was walking back through the path, I had my flashlight on and kept looking around me. I felt paranoid being alone in the dark. As I was walking, I distinctly remember hearing my grandma's voice call my name from the tree line. It sounded so real and normal that I turned around instantly, only to immediately go cold, realizing that my grandma is deceased. This freaked me out but I tried my best to somewhat convince myself that I was just hallucinating because I was paranoid. Only about a minute later, I turned around behind me with my flashlight out of fear. That's when I saw it. It looked like a gray blob, pretty much like a human sprinting at me full speed in the pitch black. I screamed like a little scared child, and I don't think I've ever run so fast in my life. When I got home, I tried to laugh it off as me seeing things and being overly anxious. But about a week later, I can't stop thinking about it. It sounded so real. I heard her voice clear as day, and the person chasing me looked so real. I've heard all those stories about skinwalkers, and while I doubt their existence, my experience was so similar to that of skinwalker encounters that I'm seriously questioning myself. What do you guys think? Is it possible that my brain was just hallucinating out of fear and anxiety? In the early 1980s, I lived in a small town near the southwest part of the Chattahoochee National Forest in Georgia. I was hunting on public land in the National Forest, just up the road from home in an area known as Cooper's Creek. I've hunted in and around that area for years and was very familiar with the terrain. When I located a good spot that I thought would give me a good chance at a large buck, I set up my lock on tree stand about 12 feet off the ground. I was hunting with a 12-gauge shotgun since rifle hunting is not allowed in this area. So fast forward to early November. I had been hunting in my tree stand several times. This particular hunt was during the late afternoon around 4.15 p.m. I wanted to get there earlier, but I was held up at work. This was a Friday afternoon, and my wife knew that I would not be home until 8.30 p.m. and even later if I had bagged a deer. I parked my truck at the trailhead and started hiking into the woods to my tree stand. The walk would take about 20 minutes. I moved slowly through the woods since I didn't want to spook any of the wildlife. As I was walking, I noticed how quiet it was, eerily quiet. I finally arrived, climbed up and settled in. I began to survey my surroundings. I began to have a disconcerting feeling like somebody was watching me. I just felt like something was out of place. After a while, I kept looking at my watch, wondering how much time I had left until dusk. I thought that I should leave early because of how I was feeling. Then... I caught movement to my right side. I slowly turned my head and began looking through the tree canopy. That's when I saw it. I honestly don't know what it was. I was staring into the trees and I saw what looked like a large human body, but it was completely blurred. 
It was moving through the trees. I could clearly see the outline of the figure, but the rest was all blurry. I couldn't focus on it. It resembled an out-of-focus blob of gelatin that was in the shape of a human. Whenever it would stop moving, I completely lost sight of it as it blended into its surroundings. I continued to watch it stop and then start moving. I do so for about 15 minutes. By that time, I was starting to become scared as I was thinking about my walk back to the truck. So I waited for another 15 minutes or so. It was getting dark by then, so I slowly climbed out of my stand. Once I hit the solid ground, I wasted no time. I sprinted all the way back to my truck. I quickly jumped into the cab. I just sat there in my truck and tried to regain my breath. I drove home and said nothing to my wife or anybody else for several weeks. During that time, I tried to convince myself that I had imagined the whole thing. I eventually told my wife one night. She listened and said that it was probably my imagination. I later told my brother who said something similar to my wife. I never told anyone else. I never hunted in those woods again. I didn't even go back for the tree stand. I took a break from hunting for about five years. I then started up again, but never in that area. I still wonder what I saw that day. I have no rational explanation. Years later, I think in 1988, the movie Predator was released. When I saw the cloaked alien on the screen, I immediately tensed up in fear. That is what I saw. I was shocked. Did I encounter an alien? I still wonder what it was that I saw that day. I no longer hunt or spend much time in the woods. I saw a thing in or near the woods on three separate occasions now. Each time I saw the thing, it was in a different state along the east coast of America, and each time the sighting was fleeting. I'm in my thirties now, and the sightings have several years between them. The first time I saw it was in high school, and this is most definitely the time I got the longest look at it. The second time I only caught a glimpse, and I'm pretty sure but not entirely sure. It was the same thing. The third time I got a clear look at it from a distance, but it caught me so off guard that I stumbled as I was taking a step and I lost sight of it. I've been calling it a thing because I have no idea what it is, and quite honestly, I don't even have a good guess either. It was not a Sasquatch, a wild man, a rake, a lizard person, or any other creature I have found through my incredibly frustrating recent internet research on the subject matter. Maybe a shapeshifter of some kind, because the first time I saw it, the thing changed its form for sure. Yes, I said it changed its form. You can go ahead and leave now if you like. If you are someone like me who will rely on science for validation, you try to keep an open mind, but you also tend to explain away people's paranormal encounters for any number of different reasons. Also, I would have expected that if I ever did end up seeing something otherworldly, it might be something that someone else had seen before, right? This post is the first time I have put any of this out there to anyone, and if it weren't for this last encounter, I would have forgotten the first two again. I have never mentioned this to anyone because of how ridiculous it sounds. The fact that I have no proof. I'm pretty much exactly the person you would think might make something like this up. At this point, though I only want to get this off my chest to hopefully find out if anyone else has ever seen this thing. Before I begin telling you what happened, I would like to make it clear that I swear what you read here is the truth about what I saw as best as I can remember. If you don't believe it, fine, whatever, I get that. This is the reason I am posting what happened here, and it is the reason that I have never, and will never, told anyone I might have to see in my daily life. I'm sure they would think I'm crazy or just desperate for attention because what I saw is downright absurd. Well, now that I have thoroughly destroyed any credibility I may have once had, I will tell you what I saw as best as I can. I have been thinking about exactly how I might explain this to someone for a while now, so I will do my best to keep out of a narrative tone. Well, now that I have thoroughly destroyed any credibility I may have once had, 
I will attempt to explain the details about what I saw as bluntly as possible with as vivid of a recollection as I have of the events. 1. First Sighting, Southern New Hampshire, 2000 or 2001 summer probably, I don't remember exactly when, well after midnight. I'm going to take some time to explain this first encounter in as much detail as I can recall even though it all happened so fast, literally lasting in total maybe 10 seconds. It is still the longest amount of time I have spent truly looking at the thing. I was walking to a friend's house from the apartment complex I lived in late at night. To get from one place to the other quickly, you had to cut through a small patch of forest, roughly 100 yards. That was technically someone else's property. A couple of times before we had someone shine a light on us, and once he fired a shot in the air to try and scare us in an attempt to get us to stop cutting through, but it never did stop us. It did, however, teach me to be stealthier when cutting through, and so on this night. I was creeping very quietly through the trees as I went. The forest was in a valley between my apartment complex. Some houses in the neighborhood where my friend lived. The valley dipped down in the middle with a steep incline surrounding it, and so at first. I had to go down into the valley, and then at the end I would walk up out of the valley, exiting the tree line right onto the street where his house is. Once exiting the tree line, one would be standing on the side of the street with the end of the road about half a mile to your right and the entrance to the neighborhood about the same distance on the left. The houses were spaced apart decently, so the night was very dark, except for the area around the houses and a couple of light circles under the orange street lights, of which there were very few for the amount of space. I got through the valley with no problem this time, and I got up some speed to go up the hill in front of me where the forest ended, maybe five feet from the edge of the street if the event was that far. At the exact moment, I came out of the tree line and onto the edge of the road. Something caught my eye to the left of me emerging from the woods across the street. It stumbled awkwardly out of the dark woods and into view right at the edge of the circle of orange light radiating down from one of the street lights. At first, and for just a brief moment, it looked like a shadow. However, I heard a sound coming from the dead leaves beneath its feet, and I quickly realized that it was not a shadow. Its body shape was like that of a starving child, maybe three feet tall, that you might see in a third world country, but its legs and arms were so thin that there appeared to be no way it could support the creature's body weight. It was dark, but from what I can remember, at the ends of its frail-looking limbs were just nubs. No hands and no feet that I saw. Its movements were the creepiest part, honestly, and they were the first thing that threw me off. I can't even really explain how absurd and unnatural its movements were, or how it was standing on those tiny legs. It moved forward from the trees and toward the street extremely awkwardly with a couple of steps that I saw it take. It was almost as if it was not supposed to be walking around like that, but it had somehow figured out a way to do so regardless. The thing was roughly two or three feet tall with an enlarged light bulb, shaped head and a little belly despite how thin the rest of its frame was. In addition to its shape and motion, the thing seemed unreal, mostly because it didn't seem to reflect any light at all when it stepped into the light of the street lamp. It appeared to have no three-dimensional form at all, with its body almost blending right into its shadow, and I could only really tell it had solid form by the way that it moved and navigated the environment around it. I froze in place instantly when I saw it with my brain, unable to even process what I was seeing. In a couple of steps it exited the trees, stumbled across the patch of grass to the street, and then sort of fumbled down forward toward a sewer drain on the side of the road. I'm not sure what I did, if anything, but as soon as it hit the curb, it rose back up and looked over at me. I couldn't see its face or anything at all, still just this bizarre black shape moving so unbelievably awkwardly. I really can't stress this enough. Its movements were ridiculously uncoordinated. What happened next is what sent me fleeing into the woods with all of the cowardice that has kept me alive to this day. 
upon seeing me, this malformed shadow child thing did this quick twisted turn toward me, dropping down to all fours and becoming a much more animal like shape when it did. I again have no idea how to describe the motion as it was so unnatural, but when its turn was complete, the thing had become something I can only describe as a shadow dog or cat or bear. I know that sounds crazy, but I can't describe it any other way than that. It stood on all fours like a predatory animal, but I couldn't make out any definition on it with the way it didn't catch the light that it was standing directly below. This thing didn't just go from being human, like to being a human on all fours. I mean, it genuinely became something else, as far as I can tell. I debated leaving this next part out because it just slices into the credibility of the events even further. But it happened, and so here it goes. As soon as the creature had hit all fours and was no longer humanoid, its eyes flashed yellow at me, and it let out a loud shriek, not a growl, not a bark. Not a snarl, not an animal-like roar, or even a hissing, but a legitimate shriek that sounded like neither a person nor an animal. The sound started quietly, then rose quickly, almost as if it was winding up or under pressure and had just painfully been forced out of the creature's mouth in great anguish. Its scream had a certain harshness to it, as if it might have had something seriously wrong with its vocal cords, or it had just smoked a million cigarettes consecutively. I remember the thing had a weird, almost scared vulnerability to the sound it made, which contrasted the harshness and tone as well as the defensive stance the creature took. All this took place in just a few seconds, maybe ten at most, from the time the thing exited the tree line to the time it turned, postured, shrieked at me, and sent me running without a single thought in my head right back into the wood. I did not stop. I did not look back. I did not try to be quiet through the forest. I just ran as fast as I could. That is correct. I was so scared I ran back into the dark, scary woods to get away, only realizing how dumb that was some time afterward. The sound it made chilled me to my core then, but now in hindsight I think the flashing eyes bother me more than the sound because it seemed so expected. The flashing or glowing eyes trope is precisely what I've heard in so many other people's stories. I never believed about mysterious creatures they claim to have encountered. I mean because that is what scary things in the night do right. They flash yellow eyes and make a scary shrieking sound at you. Obviously, what else would they do? I never made it to my friend's house that night, and I never mentioned this to anyone ever since. I managed to forget about this experience pretty quickly, though. I'm not sure how my life was high drama at the time, so I'm sure it is because I did something stupid, and that took over my world. 2. Second Sighting, Central Florida 2006 spring, I believe. Early night, 8 p.m. The second sighting is much briefer, and as I mentioned before, I'm 90% sure it was the same thing, but I'm not entirely sure. I'll keep this short and tell you simply that I was out camping, went for a walk along a trail, and watched my girlfriend hop from rock to rock across the river. I heard a sound to my left, and when I turned to look, I saw an extremely thin, skinny, black, nubbed leg, possibly a tail, disappear behind a tree as if an animal running away from something. I ran over this time, but I found nothing, and I didn't mention it to my girlfriend. No experiences or weird sounds that night, and no more encounters for several years. If you like more detail about this one, you can attempt to email me with any questions and I will try to remember. 3. Third Sighting, Eastern Shore of Virginia, June 8, 2019, late night, 11 p.m. Well, finally, here it is, the reason I felt I had to put this out there, and the reason I am so freaked out by this thing. It's not so much what happened last week, as it was another quick glimpse and nothing else, but instead, it is the fact that it happened again to me, and as far as I know no one else. Last week I was at a party at a friend's house celebrating her birthday because she is one of those people in their 30s that still gets excited about those things. I don't drink, so I was not drunk, but 
in the interest of total transparency, I have been known to partake in the occasional medicinal herbal supplement for recreational purposes. You can take that information however you like. My friend lives with her husband in a farmhouse surrounded by open fields for a couple of acres in any direction, surrounded, of course, by a thick forest. I had been there for a while, and the thing was the furthest thing from my mind. We were all just hanging out and rambling on about the usual inane bullshit. I decided that I wanted to smoke, and so I went out the front door and onto the porch. I stepped forward and went to step down the front steps to get a little more space, and as I did, I glanced up and out into the field in front of the house. There it was, roughly fifty yards out and bumbling through the field toward the trees. For a split second, I could see the unmistakable shape of this weird shadow child thing. It was just the same as before. Large head and belly, unbelievably thin arms and legs, and again reflecting absolutely no light at all. I was mid-step when I glanced up and lost track of where I was stepping, causing me to fall forward. I managed to catch myself as I fell barely, and I must have made a sound when I did it, because when I looked back up, the thing was on all fours, quickly running like a dog off into the woods. I reiterate this thing did not move on all fours like a person in any way, but it moved like an animal with knees bent backward. I was too far away, and it happened too fast for me to tell if it had hands and feet this time. I started to walk out and look around a bit when someone came outside, and not wanting to tell anyone, I just went back to the party. I must have been distant the rest of the night because I couldn't get it out of my head this time. I ended up leaving the party relatively early and went home to start obsessing about it, as I have been for about a week now. So I am sufficiently freaked out by a lot of things about what I have seen. Even discounting the second sighting, I got two brief but good looks at something that I cannot explain. One of the things that bothers me the most about this is, why me? Why, as far as I know, have I been the only one to see this thing? If it knows of me and is following me or something like that, then why does it seem surprised by my presence each time I've seen it and then enter a sort of fight or flight mentality? If it doesn't know of me, then why am I the only one to see this thing and now in three different states, years apart? I have so many questions. I'm writing this over a few days to make sure I've got all the details as best as I can remember, and I hope I'm not the only one that saw this creepy thing. What I saw that night was so unnatural I never expected to see anything like it in my life. It honestly just did not belong in our physical reality, and it almost did not even seem to fit in the environment around it as if it was something 2D superimposed into an authentic 3D background. I looked into shadow people videos and sightings, but I don't think this was that, as there was nothing ghostly about what I saw. It was there and had solid form. It was so out of place, but at the same time I saw it there and heard it as well. I don't know what else to say about it. Each time, except the second, I could see enough of it that I could tell it was not somebody messing with me, and I could see enough of it to say it did not belong here in this world with us. My best guess at this point is that it and I crossed each other's paths in a possible interdimensional rift or time, slip only because of how surreal the experience was. I know that sounds crazy, but it is all I've come up with to rationalize the fact that this thing did not fit into its surroundings in any way. It did not even look like it was made to move and get around in this world. The force of gravity should have, for sure, crushed its skinny legs under the weight of its body. It was like an eggplant on toothpicks. That is all that it is for me to tell, but I sincerely hope someone else saw something like this, so I know I am not starting to lose it. At this point, I only want to know that I am not alone and that what I saw has some explanation Rational or not, I don't even care, please. Just give me something to go on. I need one reasonable answer from somewhere at this point because I know what I saw and I can't get the way this thing moved or how dark it was out of my head.
During my spring break of 1977, my family and three other families from the neighborhood, I grew up and traveled to a Holiday Inn in Navarre Beach. My mother had told me it was a newly opened hotel. It had an indoor pool, arcade, gift shop, deli, and small movie theater. For its day, it was considered to be a very nice place, and my family went to this hotel three times. During our second visit in August of 1977, the film Jaws, I, I was being filmed at Navarre, and I even got to see the mechanical Jaws stored with other movie equipment and props in the eastern portion of the hotel parking lot. During the spring break vacation around late March of 1977, there was a special showing of the film Bugsy Malone, which only children were permitted to attend. It was during the film that I started to feel a bit disoriented. I heard some other children crying, and I heard the sound of someone throwing up. At one point in the film, I got up from my chair to leave, but I was quickly escorted back to my chair by an usher in a black suit and black hat. I saw one or maybe two more men in black suits at the back of the theater. After the film was over, I felt just fine, and I never did complain to anyone about that experience. One evening on this vacation, I awoke and sat up in my bed. I looked across the room and could see a group of small figures in the dimly lit room. My brother was asleep to my right, and my parents were asleep in the bed to my left. The feeling I felt was something I had felt before, which I immediately recognized. It was a feeling I only felt when the greys were near. I thought, it's been a while, and to a young boy about to turn seven, it had been over two years since his last encounter with the greys, so it had felt like a long time. But then I could not move, and one of the figures moved towards me very fast, and the last thing I recalled was its big black eyes very close to my face and a wand, like object being pointed at me. Then there was blackness. The next thing I recall was being in the sand dunes away from the hotel in a circle of children. I must have been one of the youngest because I was the shortest. But my attention was more on the blue object directly over us that had a glowing blue light all about it. The closest thing I've seen to this shade of blue would be that of the blue glow of Cherenkov radiation that I've only seen in photos. Then there was blackness. The next morning was a Saturday and I was watching cartoons. It was not till I was watching TV that I recalled that night's experience with the greys and seeing the blue glowing sphere above me and the other children. I then told one of the other children who were traveling with us on this trip about my experience that night and she did not believe me. I also recall walking around the hotel later that day and then getting up the nerve to tell my older brother who also teased me. I need some outside perspective to make sense of this because I am at a loss. I can't quite remember how old I was, maybe five-ish. I have this super vivid memory and I can't quite make sense of it. My mom just brought it up tonight and it was crazy hearing it from her perspective. One night when I was around five, we had some family friends come over with their kids. We had an underground room beneath the house that was like a basement or spare bedroom area. All of us kids loved playing in the downstairs room. That night, we built a fort with some mattresses and blankets. The family friends went home later that night, and I remember my mom tucking me into bed. We had a whole good night routine for all of my teddies so they didn't feel left out. I fell asleep in my bed. I woke up later in the night because I felt cold. I was in the blanket fort in the downstairs room. I bolted awake. I was so scared of the dark and was so confused as to how I got there. The downstairs room had a bit of an eerie vibe on a good day, and this night it was so dark and cold. I felt like I was being watched and closed in on, like the same panic you get when you run up the stairs quickly at night. I bolted out of the downstairs room up to the ground level where the backyard was and then up the back stairs to the back door. I was sobbing, screaming, and pounding at the back door. I woke my whole house up, my parents and sister. My parents rushed to the door to unlock it. 
They double-checked the door and windows and everything was closed and locked. Everything locks from the inside. My mom brought it up tonight and we've talked about it before a bit in the past, but I asked her what she remembered. She put my sister and me into bed. She said she woke up to me banging on the back door and screaming. My parents got me inside and tucked me in again after a lot of comfort and snuggles. My mom said she was sure she tucked me into bed and that. She has no idea how or why I got outside when the whole house was locked. Also, I would never do that as a five-year-old. The house we were living in at the time had a bit of spiritual presence. Real, weird, unexplainable things that have happened, but nothing scary or malicious, just making themselves known or residual haunting. It's only happened once or so each time, but we had unexplainable and very clear footsteps, knocking full-body apparitions, and other weird things happen. I did sleepwalk a bit as a child, maybe an explanation, but also, how did I get out of the house when all the doors and windows were locked and could only be locked from the inside? There is no way I had the cognitive ability to lock up after myself or have a house key, and the windows locked from the inside at five years old. For my own sanity, I have been trying to make sense of this because the alternative is a real kick in the pants. I'm thinking more of a paranormal experience, which is you and also all. So my question for you is, what the heck happened? How could I have gotten out of the house and ended up in the mattress fort we had built in the downstairs room? Do you have other theories or questions as to what happened to me? Please help. I was a keen sailor once I was out snorkeling in the Whit Sundays, having a blast checking out Nemo and all his mates, just floating about in the zone, as it were. Well, that zone was rudely interrupted when I suddenly realized I was surrounded by a swarm of jellyfish all around me, out of the blue. What the F, Australia? Naturally, I freaked out, but some sort of survival instinct kicked in. Otherwise, I probably would have drowned myself in a flumux. I just gently, carefully floated the F out of there, and then sped back to the boat. Honestly, it was rather horrific, even if it doesn't sound that bad. One time when I was in middle school, my dad had a boat and we were going out to deep sea fish in the waters between Mexico and California. We saw about three aircraft carriers and a couple other ships all surrounding this area of about five miles. We didn't know what it was, but we continued to go out to fish and then a couple hours later we heard the loudest boom I've ever heard in my life. We looked around and spotted an aircraft carrier, and my first thought was that they were firing a missile at us. Law. Then while we were heading back to the docks, we started to see TVs, dressers, and other random things floating in the water. We actually caught an El Dorado hiding under the dresser, too. Haha, <laughs> but anyways, we found out it was when the United States captured one of the biggest drug cartel leaders and the Coast Guard and military was bringing him to the United States on boat, and then an aircraft carrier blew the drug cartel leader's boat up when we heard the loud boom, which explains everything once we found that out. But that was the creepiest thing I've seen out there. We went sailing in the British Virgin Islands for a vacation when I was 16 with another family, two sets of parents, myself, and their 13-year-old, for 10 days on a 30-ish foot sailboat. I can't remember. It felt small. I am terrified of swimming in water where I can't see the bottom, but there it was, crystal clear. It was halfway through our trip and we went to visit and snorkel the wreck of the Rhone, which looked just under the water from the surface, but was actually pretty far down. The water started to get too choppy for my taste, and seeing the scuba divers and huge tarpon fish, harmless, was making me uneasy, so I told everyone I was going back to the boat. They all decided to follow to our mooring. 
When I got close to the boat, I noticed something under the boat. The keel part of the boat has always scared me for some reason, too, so I try to avoid looking at it. As I get closer, the rest of the crew following me, I realize it is a five barracuda. This thing is nasty and just hanging under the keel like it wasn't moving. Of course, I knew they were dangerous, but I also had on jewelry, a belly ring, 90s, and a shiny gold swimming suit. I stop dead, everyone else gathers behind me, and a few of us surface to decide how we will approach the ladder of the boat, while the rest watch said fish for movement. Being that I had tons of adrenaline and was a competition swimmer, I offered myself up first. I swam the fastest I've ever swam and pulled myself up as fast as I could, looking it directly in the eye until I surfaced. The rest of the crew not quite as nimble as I am. I'm pretty sure there was some rum involved. Hung back. The fish didn't move, so one by one they frantically swam to get on the boat. That fish did not get to taste any of our crowd. It didn't stop there. The water started to get even more choppy. I had on a motion. Sickness patch because I had never been on a sailboat so long, so I was okay. But suddenly tropical storm warnings start to come across the radio as a giant gray cloud closes in. It went from a beautiful tropical day to hell within 15 minutes. We scrambled inside, life vests, radioing as they rushed to take down the sails. Suddenly a gust of wind took the main sail and almost dipped the entire boat sideways. The mast was within feet of the water. My decision to swim back to the boat early, Barracuda and all, proved to have been almost intuitive. For the next few hours, there was zero visibility in the scariest moments of my young life. We were no longer moored, so they just took down the sails, faced the bow into the wind, and basically motored in place. We couldn't see the islands, any other ships just pelting rain and the boom of the hull hitting trough of each wave. They had to take turns steering because it was blinding and disorienting and took turns riding out the storm inside. I don't remember how high they said the waves were, but I remember feeling a sense of imminent death. When I'm afraid, I mean petrified. I shut down and everything happens in slow mo. With each wave, it felt like the boat went flying up into the air on the crest. Then a moment of flying feeling, then crashing down so hard that I was sure the hull of the boat was going to split open. This went on for hours. So to paint the picture, I am just sitting at the table holding on for dear life and dodging falling unsecured items in my life jacket. The 13-year-old is screaming and crying. We are going to die over and over in different ways. My mother has her head in the garbage can and is holding on, trying to throw up, until finally her fear kicks in and things start coming out of both ends every time she heaves. Then I'm consoling her that it's okay. The three others are coming in and out for breaks each time we can see that it looks more and more like a hurricane outside. Eventually, I find my composure, yell at the girl to shut the F up because she isn't helping anyone, and move some towels under around my mom and try to help her clean up while she cried, which she was trying desperately to console me but was too seasick to get a word in. But she knew I was emotionally mature enough to do the best I could to take charge. It felt like hours of near death, up and down. Silence, then crash. Flying, then feeling the boat would crack over and over while everyone else is screaming at each other. Finally, hours later, it just stops. Dead calm. We see we are approaching an island, Virgin Gorda or Peter Island. I can't remember. And as if nothing happened, we pull up into the marina on a calm and quiet sea. None of us talk really until our feet hit the dock, except my mother, whom I helped shower off and clean up. We cheered, hugged, laughed. I finally cried, and we walked ashore to get the F away from that boat for a while. We found a gorgeous bath facility attached to the marina, and showered and basked in light of being alive. We asked what is the nicest restaurant here, and were directed to this small, quaint place right on the water. We ate and drank. I was legal there. 
ordered giant plates of delicacies and just laughed in wonder about how happy we were to be alive, no crashing into anyone or an island, drifting running out of fuel, boat breaking in half, being swept away or drowning. We were happy to be alive, though I haven't been on a single hull sailboat since. I prefer catamaran style now, I guess. I wanted to take the time to describe a terrifying experience that I recently had during my travels for work. To this day, logic still defies the events that transpired, and they have haunted me ever since. I am still afraid to stop my car at highway rest areas to this very day. I recently landed a position in sales with a very solid company in the medical device industry. Being in my mid-twenties, I am thrilled to work for such an innovative company. The money is great, the job is fun, and hell, they even gave me a company vehicle. That's a great perk. The only downside to the job is that my sales territory is quite expansive and covers several states, and because of budget constraints, they expect me to drive to most of my customers. I could not complain, however. Not many people my age get these kinds of opportunities. I finished up my work day at a hospital in central Pennsylvania when I received a phone call from a clinic in western New York that wanted to place a buy for my products, but before they could do so, they wanted a product demo. Not wanting to lose the opportunity, I agreed to be there by 9 a.m. My GPS showed the trip to be five hours if I took a highway that cut through the Allegheny Forest. Being that it was now 5 p.m., I figured that I could make the drive now since I had a bag packed with extra scrubs, toiletries, and product manuals from my current trip. I headed to a gas station, filled my SUV, purchased some snacks and two energy drinks, and hopped on the single-lane highway north towards New York State. It was the middle of November and quite cold, with the sun setting early and giving way to darkness in the late afternoon. By the time I had started my drive, it was already dark. Thick clouds were obscuring the moonlight. A wall of trees surrounded my vehicle on both sides, making it seem that I was driving my SUV through a tunnel of wood in darkness. The headlights from my vehicle, illuminating the staggered white lines separating. The lanes of the highway were the only source of light. The drive definitely took on an ominous feel. I thought nothing of it as I slugged back my energy drinks and listened to some comedy podcast to pass the time. When I was about two hours into my drive, the inevitable happened when one has had large amounts of caffeine and a belly full of gas station snacks. I had to find a restroom eventually, which I was au quiz since I wanted to get out of the car and stretch my legs anyway. I had passed a small town about 15 minutes back, and I knew that I would need to find another one and pull off the highway or see if there was a rest stop anywhere ahead. Almost as if fate had heard me beckoning, I saw a sign that said rest area two miles. This is my lucky night, I thought, as I realized that I would not have to resort to relieving myself in the middle of the woods on a dark and creepy night. I came upon the rest area, which was located right off of the side of the highway. It was nothing like the rest areas one is used to encountering on major highways. There were no restaurants or vending machines. There was a single lonely picnic table and a garbage can on a patch of grass and two separate brick buildings with brown metal roofs on them. A single overhead street lamp barely illuminated my oasis as it was flickering on and off probably from neglect considering how remote this place was and how little use it was getting. The building to the left housed the ladies' restrooms, while the one to my right housed the men's restrooms. I placed my car and park in one of the ten available spots in front of the buildings and grabbed my phone to keep me entertained while I took care of business. As I walked on the narrow concrete walkway towards the restrooms, I caught a glimpse of something in the woods behind the rest area. It was still quite dark outside, and the overhead light provided too little illumination to discern what I was looking at. All I could see at that distance was an obscure black shape shifting through the thick trees. 
It could have simply been my eyes playing tricks on me since I'd spent the better part of the day either in a brightly lit operating room or driving down a pitch-black highway. I shrugged my shoulders and made my way into the men's room. There were three stalls at the far end of the restroom, flanking three urinals. Two flimsy overhead lights with exposed bulbs were the only sources of light. One of the panels had a bulb completely out, and the other was flickering sporadically, making the entire room look like it was lit by strobe lights in a nightclub. Just perfect, I thought. I'm stuck in the creepiest bathroom in the world, and I can barely see anything. I decided not to make a big deal about it. I'd be back on the road shortly. I took the stall in the middle. I had no reason why. I'd simply just randomly selected it. I sat down and nearly jumped from how cold the seat was. This was becoming quite an annoyance. At that moment, I had no idea, but things were about to get a whole hell of a lot worse. As I was in the midst of doing my business, the lights went out. Of all the times that this pathetic single tubular bulb could have called it quits, it had to do so when I was using a restroom in one of the most isolated spots in the state. You've got to be kidding me, I groaned out loud. At this point, the light from my phone was the only source of light cutting through the shroud of darkness that crept over the entire room. It was only at this point that I realized how quiet it had been this entire time. Aside from sound of the slight breeze outside hitting the building, it was dead silent. I sat there in silence, playing games on my phone when I first heard it. At first it sounded like a faint shuffling sound, the obscure noise of someone or something making its way towards the entrance of the restroom. I found this rather odd because I would have heard another vehicle pull up since the parking lot was right across from the two buildings. The shuffling then became more discernible. It was footsteps. Slow, trudging footsteps were making their way into the restroom. By how loud they were, whoever or whatever this was had entered the room. As the footsteps continued, I noticed that they were making a slapping sound against the tile floor. It was as if this person, or a thing, was barefoot. The footsteps became heavier and louder, and I noticed that they were moving towards the stalls. I locked my phone screen and sat there frozen with fear. My heart was pounding out of my chest and sweat started to creep across my brow despite the chill in the air. By this point, along with the heavy slapping footsteps, I heard the breathing. This thing's breathing was too otherworldly to be human. It took long, heavy, animal-like breaths and exhaled in a way that resembled an asthmatic with a faint whistle at the end. I had never heard such a thing. By this point, my bowels were completely voided from fear, and I was grateful that I had been sitting on a toilet, for I would have shut my pants had I not been. This foreboding presence continued to trudge towards me until I heard its heavy breaths right outside the door to the stall. In the pitch-black restroom, all I could hear was this thing breathing a mere few feet away from me. Now certain that it was aware of my presence, my heart continued to pound as I heard it shuffle around outside of the stall. I had never felt so helpless in my life. I was trapped here at the mercy of this creature. After what I imagined was several minutes, the breathing quieted down some. I had pulled my feet up and I was squatted on the toilet in fear of this thing seeing me. I knew that it was still there, but for whatever reason, call it curiosity or perhaps a fear. Induced lack of judgment, I took out my phone and flicked up the flashlight app and pointed it at the floor. Underneath the stall door entrance, I nearly dropped my phone in horror at what I saw. Two massive feet were pointed straight at me. They were unbelievable large, too large to be human. The tops of them were covered with a matted brown and gray hair, while the toes were a pale purplish colored flesh with toenails that were long, ragged, and yellow. I barely had time to notice the grotesque feet of this creature when it took notice of the light and let out a monstrous growl that shattered the silence of the pitch-black room. It sounded like a growl that came straight from hell. It was a primal, guttural, inhuman voice. The noise was deafening. 
My terror had completely overtaken me as I fell onto the floor and prepared to meet my doom at the hands of this beast. I closed my eyes as I heard it begin to pound on the door, cracking noises indicating that it was getting closer on every strike to breaking the stall open and getting its probably equally grotesque hands on me. Just when I thought that I was a dead man, the monster had quieted down and ceased its assault on the stall door. I opened my eyes. I was still alive, for now. It was then that I heard another familiar sound from the other side of the room, those heavy, slapping footsteps. Jesus Christ, there are two of them, I thought as terror pierced every muscle in my body as I lay limp on the floor. I heard the second set of footsteps grow closer, slap. 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 As I prepared to meet my fate, where I'd no doubt be torn in half by two forest beasts, that's when the face-off happened. Both creatures began to growl at each other back and forth as if locked in some sort of display of alpha male aggression. After several exchanges, they made their move. I heard the sound of flesh hitting flesh and bodies slamming up against the walls. I flicked my flashlight app back on and pointed it towards the noise as I looked from under the stall. The two creatures were locked in a life-and-death melee. They were growling inhumanly as they pushed each other back and forth, blood spilling onto the floor from what I imagined was them clawing and biting at each other in this life-and-death struggle. As their battle continued, one began to back away out of the entrance to the men's room, and the other followed in a frantic sprint. I still heard their inhuman growls as their battle continued outside, until their voices trailed off into a barely audible drone in the woods. As terrified as I was, I got to my feet and exited the stall. I pointed the light from my phone and against the floor. There was dark red blood and tufts of grayish-brown fur all over the floor. It looked like someone field dressed an animal carcass in here. The stench was unbearable. It smelled like the inside of an animal cage at the zoo. What the hell were these things? I was not going to stick around and find out. I sprinted back to my car, entered, slammed the door shut, and peeled out of the parking lot like I was in a street race against death. My truck tires screeched as I careened out of the entrance and back onto the highway. I was covered in sweat and hyperventilating, having narrowly escaped a horrible death at the hands of some primal beasts from a forgotten era. I sped the rest of the way to my destination in New York. I arrived and checked into a hotel. I sat at the bar and downed several scotches before even dropping my bags in the room. My rattled nerves settled down eventually and I made my way to my room. I lay on the bed sleepless but sure of two things. I was not taking that route back home and I was never stopping at a rest stop ever again. I remember walking out of my mother's room two years ago. I saw at the end of the hallway out of the corner of my eye a black figure walking straight into my room. Terrified me. I could go on and on about these stories and similar ones, so comment specifically if you want me to respond with more. A couple days later, my then-boyfriend came over. Very Christian. Didn't believe in ghosts, told me all the time would make jokes and try to scare me because it humored him. I walked him out to his car as he was leaving that night. He seemed freaked out and went home kind of quickly. He FaceTimed me once he got home and said, I didn't want to freak you out, but I saw a black figure in your window staring at us while we were outside. My mom sensed a horrible energy when I got home too. I never told him about the black figure I saw because I assumed he would make fun of me or try to scare and get a riot out of me. In May, my best friend's wife offered to fly me out as a surprise for our birthdays, which are two days apart. They just had a baby and she thought it would be a fun relief. They live on the second floor of a huge brownstone in one of the oldest parts of the city right near the Alaclini Cemetery. I've worked in many haunted kitchens and have seen things but never actually had contact. I'm also very sensitive to the veil and very intuitive, so I think I tend to attract wandering energies. 
I also have night terrors, which have gotten a lot less frequent since I went to a psychic, and usually my partner is there to wake me up if I am trying to scream. So, the first night I was there, I was sleeping on a pad in the living room with the door open, my friends in their bedroom with the baby and the door closed. I was lying on my back and started having a nightmare, but it was different. It felt like there was something at the end of my feet waving its hands in my face like the jester thing from a jack. In your box playing the uh, I'm not touching you game like a child. Like usual, I struggled to wake myself up and tried to say something like, please leave me alone, but I just ended up yelling incoherently and bolting up. I was embarrassed that I screamed out loud in the middle of the night in a house with a newborn and thought I'd have to apologize in the morning. And also, of course, ask about ghosts. I drifted back to sleep but again felt another presence and woke up to see a figure standing above me in a plaid black and white shirt, thinking it was my friend who I must have woken up. I pulled myself up on my elbows. I called out his name, which coincidentally is actually Casper. Sorry if I woke you up. The figure's energy seemed kind of mischievous. I thought I felt a smile, if that makes sense. The figure bent down, picked up a small plush toy, and threw it at my face. It hit me, without a doubt. Hit me in the face. I yelled what the actual F and grabbed my phone, still thinking it might have been Casper trying to wake me up so I'd stop screaming. Turned on a light. No Casper and nothing near my head that resembled a small plush toy. I said a few prayers and went back to sleep. The next morning, I asked his wife, Bailey, if I woke them up and if the house was haunted. She didn't even look up. Who did you see? I described the events in the figure in a white and black plaid shirt. She said, oh, that's Ariel. She lived here before us and died here in the dining room. She really liked wine. That's why we sleep with the door closed. Just close it tonight and she'll probably leave you alone. She said that there was another one, a girl in a white nightgown that they only very occasionally see near a locked door that leads to an old attic. She also said that their downstairs neighbor had a distinctly bad spirit that lurked near the door outside. When Casper got home later, Bailey just said, Guess who I met last night? And he just laughed and said, Oh, you met Ariel? She's a little scamp. He told a story about being alone and watching a glass of Cabernet. Ariel's favorite slide across the counter from across the kitchen. He said it was like a movie and couldn't really believe it until he had to run over and grab the glass before it was knocked off the counter. I closed the door for the rest of the week and didn't have any other encounters. Like I said, I have many stories about other experiences. But this was the first time I had actual physical contact. During the summer of 2008, I stayed with an aunt and uncle for a few months because I wasn't getting along with my parents. Another story for another day. While staying there, I worked overnights at a local convenience store. During the day, I was mostly alone while my aunt and uncle worked. At this point in my life, I had not experienced anything paranormal and did not believe in ghosts or spirits or the afterlife. I was 19 and knew everything. However, as soon as I moved in, I was faced with experiences that changed my perspective forever. The first one, I was alone. It was about 9 a.m., and I had just finished my shift, and I was preparing to wind down and get ready for bed. I was alone as usual. Both my aunt and uncle were working, so I had the house to myself. I was sitting in the downstairs living room eating. Out of seemingly nowhere, I heard what sounded like an adult running through the kitchen, which paralleled the living room and was completely out of view to me. A bang, and the footsteps went into the den that connected to the kitchen. I bolted up and went to the kitchen to investigate the sound. There was a coffee pot on the floor. That must have been the bang I heard when it hit the floor. I headed towards the den to see who was in there. However, it was empty. There was no way for anyone to have been in the den and me not see them. I shrugged it off and figured I was tired and went to bed. 
A few weeks later, my alarm woke me up at 9 p.m. for work. I groggily got up and headed towards the bathroom that was directly across my room. However, the door was shut. I could see the light shining from under the door, and I heard the distinct sound of someone sweeping the floor. Swish, swish, swish. It sounded like an old-fashioned straw broom. I found this very odd, considering no one besides myself used that bathroom, and I couldn't think of why anyone would be sweeping it at 9 p.m. at night. But I patiently waited some time for whoever was in there to finish up. After a few minutes, I couldn't wait any longer because I had to start getting ready for work. I approached the bathroom door. I could still hear the sweeping. And I gently knocked and asked if they were almost done. But to my surprise, the sound abruptly stopped. I opened up the door and no one was there. I brushed this experience off as well and pushed it to the back of my mind. This last experience is the reason I ended up moving out. It was too terrifying to ignore what I knew what was happening in that house. My sister stopped by during the day to see me and her and I were in the back room hanging out and chatting. The door to the hallway was closed. My aunt and uncle were working so her and I were the only two people who were home. As we gabbed away, we suddenly heard what sounded like 1920s music coming from downstairs. We froze and fell silent. The music grew louder and louder until it sounded like it was coming from every corner in the house. The music sounded like it was being played from a record player. My sister and I just stared at one another, too terrified to speak. Then we heard what sounded like a party erupting from downstairs. It sounded like 30 or more people were downstairs. Sounds of laughing, talking, and chinaware clinking filled the house. Then what we heard next terrified me. Loud, heavy footsteps started making their way upstairs where my sister and I were. Boom, boom, boom. It was slow but purposeful. The party sounds and music had reached a deafening level, but I could still hear those heavy footsteps above all the other sounds. Eventually, I heard the footsteps make it to the second floor. Then they slowly started stomping towards the closed door my sister and I sat behind. When the footsteps reached our door, I leapt up and yanked the door open. When I did, all the noise in the house stopped. The party, the music, the stomping. There was no one behind the door. The hallway was empty and the house was dead silent again. My sister and I wasted no time racing out of the house and staying outside until our aunt and uncle came home. They didn't believe our story, and I moved out shortly afterwards and never stepped foot in that house again. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.